All right, council member, if you give me uh, and everyone, if you could give us just one more second, I want to ensure that our public witnesses are able to um, hear our interpreter. I'm going to confirm that uh, momentarily. Apologize for the delay here. Council member, um, we are live on YouTube um, and I'm going to go ahead and have us uh, get started at this time. Um, if witnesses uh, identify uh, challenges with accessing our interpretation or anything else, um, please uh, post a message in the chat uh, or uh, shoot me an email at the email you signed up on and um, we will get that sorted out uh, as necessary. Um, council member, uh, you may begin when you are ready. Good afternoon. I'm Robert White, council member at large and chair of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. Today is Thursday, February 24th, 2022. The time is now 12.17 p.m. And I'm calling to order this performance oversight hearing of the committee regarding the Office of Risk Management, Office of Human Rights, and Commission on Human Rights. The first agency on today's agenda is the Office of Risk Management. ORM provides risk management direction, guidance, and support through four divisions, the Workers' Compensation Division, the Risk Prevention and Safety Division, the Insurance Division, and the Tort Liability Claims Division. While I'll reference all of ORM's activities, it's important to note that this committee shares jurisdiction over various aspects of ORM operations and legislation with the Committee on Business and Economic Development and the Committee on Labor and Workforce Development. Between the Workers' Compensation Division and the Tort Liability Division, ORM has the critically important role of ensuring district residents and employees are made whole after an injury loss of property or damage attributable to the district. As the administrator of all public sector workers' compensation claims, ORM is responsible for ensuring that all benefits are paid for injuries or illnesses caused by a government employee's work. In administering this vital program, ORM is charged with responding to workplace injuries with the best and utmost appropriate and best and most appropriate medical care at a reasonable cost, ultimately giving employees the ability to safely return to work if possible. District employees must have confidence that the district government cares about them and will take care of them if they are harmed on the job. This program is essential to maintaining and restoring the health and safety of all public sector employees in the district, and it is critical that it functions with compassion. ORM also receives, investigates, and resolves tort liability claims against the District of Columbia. If the district government injured you or their negligence and injured you, you might have a tort liability claim against the district. In addition to serving as the responding agency after an incident has occurred through its Risk Prevention and Safety Division, or RPS, 
ORM proactively ensures that all district government employees have a safe and healthy work environment. Among its many responsibilities, RPS conducts workplace inspections and job hazard analyses, leads the risk management council, develops risk prevention and safety policies, and responds to safety and health complaints. Finally, ORM also oversees risk insurance on behalf of the district government. Through the Captive Insurance Agency, ORM can minimize and control risk for the district by procuring insurance to meet the district's needs. Additionally, ORM's insurance division partners with district agencies to ensure they maintain proper insurance requirements when engaging contractors to provide services for the district. ORM has many critical tasks within its jurisdiction that keep our residents and employees healthy and safe, so I'm eager to hear more from Director Ross today. After Director Ross, um, <clears throat> we will hear from the leadership of the Office of Human Rights and Commission on Human Rights. OHR's oldest and most central responsibility is to enforce our cherished anti-discrimination law, the Human Rights Act of 1977. At nearly 45 years old, the HRA is not a perfect statute, and I'm sure we will hear today from public witnesses with ideas to refine its protections. My colleagues and I have been working on some improvements ourselves with gracious input from Director uh, Nin Khan and her team. But HRA is still a law that all district residents should be proud of. It prohibits discrimination based on any of over 20 characteristics, including in employment, housing, and public administrative accommodations. And when discrimination does take place, the HRA offers not only a right to sue in superior court, but also an opportunity to seek administrative remedies before the Commission on Human Rights. The administrative process goes like this. The person who believes they have been subjected to unlawful discrimination submits an initial inquiry with OHR. OHR schedules an intake interview <clears throat> and compiles the complainant's concerns into formal charging documents. There is a mandatory attempt at mediation. If the parties cannot settle their dispute, staff conduct an investigation consisting primarily of interviews and the collection of formal written statements and the then government attorneys, investigators, and the director work together on a letter of determination that states whether or not there is probable cause to believe that there has been an HRA violation. But the process doesn't end there. The parties engage in a second mediation session, and then the Commission on Human Rights takes over. An administrative law judge presides over an evidentiary hearing and prepares a recommended ruling including any recommended penalties. Then the commission, a panel of private citizens with documented experience or interest in anti-discrimination work, renders a final decision. The current chairperson of the commission is Motoko Azua. The commission provides an independent perspective and functions somewhat like a jury in a court case. Now, that process may sound long and drawn out, but if anything, I've, un I've understated the difficulty of seeing a discrimination complaint through to a final resolution. Often cases can drag on for many months and years, and the office has struggled with a substantial backlog in cases. Last year, this committee approved substantial new resources to support OHR in trying to dig itself out and get on top of its caseload. With this committee support, a OHR's budget has now more than doubled in the past two years. Today's hearing is an opportunity to hear how well all those investments are working so far. We also hope to understand what else the office and commission may need to fulfill HRA's lofty promise, an equitable place to work, live, learn, and do business. Finally, I will have the questions for Director Kine regarding OHR's other assorted responsibilities, including making sure that people with little or no English language proficiency have full access to local government resources. We will start to move 
to our first panel of public witnesses. Everyone should have received a copy of the witness list. Uh, I will call the folks on the witness list in the order that they appear on that list. When I call you, you will be promoted uh, as a panelist. You will drop out of the hearing momentarily and return back in as a panelist. At that time, you can unmute yourself. Public witnesses will be provided with four minutes to testify. Advisory neighborhood commissioners will be provided with five minutes to testify. Our first panel, uh, we will do panels of 10. Uh, first panel will include Michael Syndrome, Susie McClanahan, Tyrone Hanley, Emily Chong, Sharice Crawford, Alana Eichner, Raina, Keisha Jones, William Lightfoot, and Benjamin Douglas. Mr. Syndrome, are you with us? I am your, uh, Mr. Chair, are you with me? Wonderful. Uh, you can begin when you're ready. Appreciate it. Hello, Mr. Lightfoot, proud councilman, how are you? Michael Syndrome, disabled veteran, served our country more than most. I trust you're having a good day, uh, uh, Chair. So out the gate with the Office of Human Rights, there needs to be a permanent director, and there is not as we speak, and there hasn't been one for quite some time. Current uh, acting director was the general counsel, and it's not working out at all. Moreover, the um, director of OHR controls the budget, not only for its office, but the commission. And also the director of OHR does the evaluation uh, for the commission chair. That ought not be. That's to be a firewall by and between the Office of Human Rights and Commission on Human Rights. And so all the more... Uh, import and necessity to have a permanent director named who is qualified based on merit, not upon what you know or who you know, I should say, but uh, clearly up, up, upon um, merit. Um, a number of decisions uh, as of late have dismissed complaints for, and I quote, administrative convenience, which ought not be, and they rely on a case that's outdated and antiquated. Uh, the case is Honig, Honig, H-O-N-I-G, versus D.C. Office of Human Rights, 388 A. 2nd, 8, uh, 887, uh, which is from 1978. Relevant part, it's about, and I, uh, it indicates here, while the finding leaves something to be desi desired from the standpoint of precision, it is evident that OHR declined to exercise jurisdiction principally because petitioner's presence in the district arose from occasional servicing of accounts here. For other purposes, his actual assignment employment was elsewhere. In other words, this is an appointment claim. And um, the office dismissed jurisdiction, and it really is not relevant. But it's used repeatedly by the office to dismiss my complaints and others for administrative convenience. That ought not be. There's a strong judicial bias favoring trial on the merits, and that has yet to um, take place uh, with the office because they repeatedly uh, dismiss. And the only avenue primarily is uh, motion to reopen. And I have filed a number of them which remain pending and acted upon. As you pointed out, Mr. Chair, you then are directed to super court, but court is very expensive and it takes forever and a day if and when uh, your case comes up. There's also the issue about uh, minimal probable cause findings. When Mary and Barry had committee oversight, he uh, opined about why is there so uh, minimal, minimal uh, uh, probable cause findings when you have an overwhelming caseload? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't add up, plain and simple. There also should be, and I applaud your effort, the term limit of the director. Previously, it was brought by emergency um, under, um, for, to the council, which um, takes considerably more uh, approval votes. Uh, if we do it outright, I think it would be uh, 
far better chance of passing, and I, that, that should be done um, as soon as possible. And then um, there needs to be also a intermediate level of appellate review. What do I mean? Out the gate, the office can just squash a case, again, for convenience sake or lack of resources or whatever kind of pretext they make up. So the only other recourse is to reopen, which I have a number uh, of those motions pending, or it's superior court. Again, court is very expensive. It's time-consuming. So I'll just say that there is a need for an intermediate level of appellate review by and between um, the council and commission, certainly on administrative dismissal cases where the facts can better be bore out. I understand they've got a lot of hungry mouths to feed. They have limited uh, resources, limited staff, but that uh, cuts off our nose in spite of our face and irrepar irreparably harms the community. Um, there is an employee at the office, uh, Sandra Gallardo, who spearheads every one of my complaints, and the outcome is always the same, denied, dismissed, denied, dismissed. And so, obviously, Ms. Gallardo cannot be presumed impartial or free of bias, and I've asked for her to be recused time and time again. She has the backing of uh, Akita Smith, sad but true, and we keep going round and round. Justice delayed is just ice denied. And there are a number of ca other cases that uh, still have yet to have an interview, telephonic, and initially, Ms. Gallardo indicated uh, on a date and time certain, call me back, I'm busy and then dismissed on its face because of that. That ought not be. That's a slap in the face of this disabled veteran who served our country more than most, um, and all others that are irreparably Mr. harmed. Mr. Syndrome, I, I hate to cut you off prematurely. You're about a minute over time, and I, I know some folks later on the panel have some time constraints. I do have questions for you, though, so I'm gonna, I'm, I, I am gonna engage you in the question round. I've gotta let you know, I've got a, uh, are you gonna do it following public now uh, because I do have a another engagement so I can stick around for a bit. What, wonderful. I'm going to get through these panelists and I'll make sure my questions to you are the first ones. Fine. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McClanahan. Hi, I'm Susie McClanahan, the Fair Housing Rights Program Manager at the Equal Rights Center. The ERC appreciates the opportunity to testify for the performance oversight hearing of the Office of Human Rights. The ERC is a civil rights organization that identifies and seeks to eliminate unlawful and unfair discrimination in housing, employment, and public accommodations in its home community of Greater Washington, D.C., and nationwide. For many years, the ERC has conducted intakes with individuals alleging housing discrimination in D.C., investigated individual claims of systemic forms of housing discrimination, pursued enforcement of the Fair Housing Act and D.C. Human Rights Act as needed, and conducted education and outreach about fair housing protections and requirements. The ERC is a complainant or non-attorney representative for individual complainants has filed more than 20 housing discrimination complaints with OHR in the last three years. First, the Fair Housing Act and DC Human Rights Act allows for fair housing claims based on a disparate impact theory. Policies and practices by housing providers that appear neutral could be considered discriminatory under a disparate impact analysis if they have a disproportionate impact on a group of of people protected by federal and local fair housing laws. Disparate impact provides a powerful tool to address systemic forms of discrimination because it makes it possible to identify and challenge more pernicious, difficult to see cases of discrimination. Given historic and ongoing discrimination that has yielded racial segregation on par with apartheid era South Africa, the district should use all the tools at its disposal to promote integration and equity in housing. However, OHR recently refused to accept a race-based housing discrimination complaint filed by the ERC that used a disparate impact analysis, claiming that the agency lacked capacity to accept such a complaint. Furthermore, OHR told the ERC that it has never accepted a complaint based on a disparate impact claim. Relatedly, OHR can more proactively address housing discrimination and reduce the burden on victims of discrimination by conducting director's inquiries. Blatant housing discrimination occurs in the district with frequency especially on the basis of source of income. Discrimination against housing voucher holders is serving as a mechanism of racial segregation in the district and must be stamped out. We cannot expect voucher holders to shoulder the burden of addressing discrimination, and we cannot address a systemic problem through individual complaints. OHR should fully use its authority to launch director inquiries in order to respond to rampant source of income discrimination. Lastly, OHR's administrative complaint process provides DC residents with an opportunity to report and challenge housing discrimination. Yet many complainants have shared that the process is time consuming, 
resource intensive and confusing to the extent that it deters them from filing or following through on complaints. Even in our role as an organization highly trained in filing OHR complaints and assisting residents through the process, we experience repeated difficulties and delays. In recent years, this has included OHR refusing to accept certain complaints on what appears to be a discretionary, discretionary basis. Seven current ERC clients have opened complaints that are more than a year old, the oldest one dating back to 2019. As a result of the difficulties and delays, ERC staff frequently grapple with how to best counsel clients who've experienced real harm due to illegal discrimination, as we are often skeptical of the likelihood that they will be able to obtain equitable relief through OHR. However, many temporary changes OHR made due to the public health emergency have improved the process for complainants and should be made permanent. For example, the ERC commends OHR for abolishing the requirement that charges be notarized last year, which it did after initially suspending the requirement at the start of the pandemic. Another opportunity to improve the process is conducting appointments by phone or video call. Previously, complainants were expected to attend appointments in person. This means a this places a significant burden on individuals who are experiencing housing instability, who do not have paid time off, or who do not have access to transportation. Complainants would benefit from the continued option of participating by phone or video. When OHR moves to return to normal operations, the agency should review each step of the complaint process to determine which temporary policy or paperwork changes could be made permanent to reduce unnecessary burdens on complainants. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. The ERC welcomes any opportunity to work in collaboration with OHR and DC Council to ensure that victims of discrimination are able to seek relief for the harm that they've experienced. Well, thank you so much. Tyrone Hanley, welcome. Dear Chair Person White and Council staff, my name is Tyrone Hanley. I have the honor of serving as the president of GLA, which is an organization dedicated to fighting for LGBTQ rights in the district. GLA is a proud member of the LGBTQ Budget Coalition and the coalition working to improve conditions at the Office of Human Rights. Following three years of advocacy from LGBTQ civil rights and legal organizations, the council has significantly increased OHR's budget to protect and promote the human rights of those in the district and address its longstanding case backlog. Since fiscal year 21, OHR staff has increased from 49.7 to 73 and has been able to reduce the number of cases assigned to investigators. Despite these victories, OHR has thus far been unable to hire for all of the budgeted positions in part due to the government's lengthy hiring process. We ask the council and mayor to address any unnecessary delays in hiring. Failure to hire causes the community to believe the agency is not making improvements despite increased funding and prevents OHR from transforming into a sustainable organization. We appreciate OHR's willingness to meet with advocates to address questions and concerns related to the agency's work. We look forward to continuing these conversations as we strive to improve the agency. GLA eagerly awaits OHR's release of part two of its 2015 Qualify and Transgender Report in the coming year. We ask the agency to develop and engage in a long-term strategy to address anti-trans workplace discrimination by working with the transgender community LGBTQ plus organizations, employers, workers, and relevant agencies. The district must treat the issue of employment for transgender people as an all hands on deck situation because far too many transgender residents are struggling to make ends meet. If OHR needs additional funds for a campaign, then the city should budget for it. Finally, GLA, GLA looks forward to H OHR's forthcoming industry standard assessment report. The report will help the district to understand how it can better structure OHR to make it as effective and efficient as possible to ensure human rights in the city are well protected. Our goal should be to make OHR a gold standard for anti-discrimination enforcement agencies in the country. GLA looks forward to continue um, to work with all partners in building a better and more effective OHR. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's beautiful, sweetheart. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, witness, Emily Chong. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Chong, and I'm a staff attorney at First Shift Justice Project. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about Office of Human Rights. First Shift, we're a nonprofit that helps parents assert their workplace rights. We deeply appreciate and believe OHR's mission, but there is additional work needed for meaningful change. 
I handle employment discrimination cases at OHR, as well as numerous fair housing cases previously at OHR as an attorney at Neighborhood Legal Services Program. And so I appreciate the opportunity to share knowledge from both the housing and employment perspectives. Because of time constraints today, I can only share one OHR case example and discuss two recommendations. However, I have submitted written testimony with five recommendations that I welcome questions on. The five recommendations are, uh, are as follows. We recommend that OHR 1 end its practice of creating separate charges for each case and rescind its proposed regulations that formalize this practice. Two, accept attorney drafted charges. Three, eliminate its election of remedies requirement. Four, end systemic bias favoring respondents who are traditionally parties in power. And five, uphold the probable cause standard. Now I'll share about one of my clients, Ms. D. Ms. D was unlawfully terminated by her employer after she took off work due to morning sickness while pregnant. Even though at first shift, we submitted one complaint questionnaire with one cohesive narrative, the OHR intake officer turned Ms. D's complaint into three different charges. In fact, OHR has done this for all of first shift's cases, at least for the past six years. Because Ms. D's termination violated three separate laws, the Protecting Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, the DC Human Rights Act, and the DC Family Medical Leave Act, OHR created three separate charges. Thus began a game of telephone. The repeated charges were often inaccurate and inconsistent. The executive director and I had to advocate at least eight times with the intake officer to fix the charges. With so many charges, the intake officer actually became confused and would make fat corrections to charge number two and number three, but not number one, and so on. This took over five weeks, and this is time that contributes to the outstanding delays at OHR. These delays happen everywhere. We actually have another client who waited over three years to receive her letter of determination since she submitted her rebuttal. And Ms. T's case, Hap is happening right now, uh, was happening in 2021, so a fairly recent case. We appreciate OHR's increased resources for increased staffing, but these tremendous delays need structural fixes as well to last. So number one, we recommend that OHR accept attorney drafted charges, and two, we recommend that OHR end its practice of separating out charges, especially from charges stemming from one factual narrative. OHR actually recently proposed new regulations that would formalize this internal practice. Under this proposal, a mother who was retaliated against and fired for applying for parental leave would likely be forced into two charges at OHR, one for universal paid leave and another one for DC FMLA, even though she has the same factual narrative. This doubles the work for OHR staff, hurts claimants, and increases backlog. OHR had, has told First Shift it would like to deal with the backlog of cases before thinking about whether or not to separate charges uh, still. But if OHR waits to make that decision, by then it could be too late. It's labor intensive and time consuming to promulgate regulations again when there is a simple fix for OHR right now. What OHR should do is remove the language in its proposed regulation that requires separate charges. So we thank you. Council Member White's office and the committee for submitting comments recommending the same recommendation, and we hope that OHR will reconsider its stance. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Importantly, we invite action on, um, you know, making meaningful change for OHR, and of course, we invite conversations on these important issues. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Alana Eichner. Good morning, Council Member White. My name is Alana and I live in Ward 1 and I'm an organizer with the DC chapter of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Um, according to recent data, there are just over 9,000 domestic workers like Reina, who you'll hear from in a moment, who work in the District of Columbia. Over 92% of domestic workers in DC are women, 91% are people of color, 71% are immigrants, the median salary is just over $25,000. And since 2018, domestic workers in DC have been asking the DC Council to pass a domestic worker bill of rights. We really hope that this is a bill the council will pass in 2022. And this law, among other things, would end the longstanding exclusion of domestic workers from DC's Human Rights Act. And we think this is a really simple and commonplace solution that would help the Office of Human Rights fulfill their mission to eradicate discrimination, increase equal opportunity, and protect human rights for anyone who lives in or works in DC. 
The vulnerability that most domestic workers face due to their gender, their race or immigration status is compounded by the isolation of domestic work jobs, which are usually just one employee alone in a private home with an employer. There's no HR department to turn to when they experience violations, and most domestic workers have no easily or accessible way to know what their rights are on the job. Um, for this reason, discrimination, including sexual harassment and abuse, is really prevalent in this field. Um, according to data that we gathered, about 36% of live-in domestic workers said that in the last 12 months, they have been verbally harassed, threatened, subjected to racial slurs, or sexually abused at work. So that's a, almost a third of domestic workers said in the last year they've experienced that. And it's really unacceptable that in the nation's capital, these workers don't have a remedy for these violations that occur frequently because they're not covered by protections against employment discrimination. It's not a coincidence that because this work has always been done by women of color that it's never been valued in the US. Enslaved women were some of the first domestic workers in this country and exclusions at the federal level of domestic workers from key workplace laws was intentional as a proxy for excluding black workers from these laws. Many of these federal exclusions trickled down to state and local laws and that's what happened in DC's human rights law. Um, our legal research indicates that before DC had home rule in 1973, the, their Human Rights Act had this exclusion for domestic workers or domestic servants, as the law says. And when DC gained home rule in 1973, there were no substantive changes made to the human rights law. And so the exclusion remained and it remains today. Over the last two years, the conditions of the pandemic have exacerbated the vulnerability of domestic work and underscore the importance of the protection of domestic workers' bill of rights. Recent survey data shows that domestic workers continue to experience significant joblessness and economic insecurity during the pandemic. And so if you're already having a hard time finding work, you're going to be much less likely to leave an abusive workplace or speak up against your employer or file a complaint because you feel like you have to take any job that you can find. Um, and when on top of this, domestic workers are not even included in the law, domestic workers have no good options often except to stay in an abusive job. Um, we appreciate your commitment, Council Member White, to end this exclusion um, of domestic workers from the human rights law. We really hope the council will act soon before this council period ends to end this exclusion and that the Office of Human Rights will play an active role in enforcing this law when the council does that. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much. Uh, next uh, public witness is Raina. Welcome. Por favor, adelante. Sí, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Arena Moreno, vivo en Washington, D.C. Arena, Arena, live in D.C. Ah, uh ah, -uh. wait, wait, wait. I, I think the interpretation is supposed to be through the interpretation channel, so it's simultaneous, not consecutive. Um, I, I will need to understand the testimony as well. So let me let me figure out what's what's happening. We have two interpreters, so it's possible that one is for us and the other is for the channel. Okay, it now looks like there's simultaneous interpretation available if you select the English channel. ¿Puedes tratar de hablar una vez más, Reina? Sí, um, ahí está bien. ¿Puedes tratar y tomar una pausa? Sí, um, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Reina, vivo en Washington, D.C., en el Distrito 4. Soy una trabajadora del hogar. He limpiado casas y cuidado ancianos. Soy una inmigrante de Honduras, tengo un hijo de nueve años y uno de cinco meses. Eh, la Oficina de Derechos Humanos debe proteger a todos los trabajadores de DC, pero las trabajadoras del hogar estamos excluidas de la ley del derecho humano de DC, por lo que no puede hacerlo sin un cambio en la ley. 
Es por eso que estoy aquí pidiendo al consejo que apruebe una carta de derecho de las trabajadoras del hogar este año para incluir a las trabajadoras del hogar en la ley de derechos humanos. Es por eso que estoy aquí hoy. Eh, me gusta este trabajo, me gusta demostrar cariño a quien lo necesita. Hago este trabajo con amor, intento hacerlo bien porque los ancianos se lo merecen. Eh, cuando cuidé a una mujer con Alzheimer, le, le, lo hacía como un bebé, le daba la comida en la boca y tengo que hacer muchas cosas, otras cosas en las casas. Pero lo que no me gusta es que este trabajo no se valora. Cuando vine por primera vez a este país, la pasé muy mal. Como no tenía documentos, fue difícil y solo me pagaban 10 dólares la hora. No tenía suficiente dinero para llegar a fin de mes. Apenas podía permitirme alquilar una habitación para mí y mi hijo y no podía comprarle las cosas que necesitaba. Con la pandemia fue muy difícil. Es como que si estuviera comenzando de nuevo. Estaba buscando trabajo, pero fue casi imposible porque también tenía que hacer tres cosas en casa y ser maestra, cuidadora de mi hijo cuando él no estaba en la escuela. Todavía estoy tratando de encontrar trabajo. La pandemia me quitó el trabajo digno que hacía tener sin culpa mía. Una vez fui a trabajar a una casa para cuidar a una anciana. Eh, también fue que me pidieron que hiciera toda la limpieza de la casa y no podía porque cocinaba y esto no fue parte de lo que acordamos. Cuando yo le pregunté a la señora por qué me ponía a hacer todo esto, ella dijo que tenía que hacerlo, que tenía que hacerlo porque yo no tenía documentos legales para trabajar y que por eso tenía que hacerlo para ganar mi dinero. Porque como era una inmigrante reciente, no conocía mis derechos. No tenía documentos, ni contrato, ni dinero. Así que me sentí que no valía nada sin poder hacer nada. Y pienso que esto es explotación. Ahora conozco mis derechos y sé que merecemos un sueldo correcto. Somos explotados de varias formas y discriminadas. He experimentado discriminación por mi origen de país, por no hablar inglés y por mi condición física. He experimentado discriminación desde muchos lados diferentes. Tengo una amiga también que fue discriminada por su idioma a pesar de que le dijeran que no era ningún problema cuando entró a trabajar. El acoso sexual es muy común en estos tipos de trabajo, que ha sido momento en que me contrataban para limpiar, para limpiar una casa y también me acosaban sexualmente. Por eso estamos pidiendo para la Carta de Derechos de Trabajadoras del Hogar, para finalmente incluir a los trabajadores domésticos en la Ley de Derechos Humanos. Somos gente especial que podemos hacer este tipo de trabajo. Es un trabajo honesto y hemos sacrificado mucho para cuidar de los niños, hogares y personas mayores de esta ciudad. Ahora necesitamos su apoyo y necesitamos cambios para que las trabajadoras del hogar seamos tratadas como las personas dignas que somos. Gracias por escuchar mi historia hoy. Uh, thank you very much for, for your testimony. Uh, our next public witness is uh, Keisha Jones. Good afternoon, council member. My name is Keisha Jones and I'm a first time parent. In 2017, I started working as a part-time support coordinator in DC. I worked while attending Howard University full-time. Although my coursework was extremely extensive, I never neglected my responsibilities at work. Throughout my pregnancy, I came into working to work over 35 hours a week, although my requirements were 20 hours. After taking job protected leave, the organization betrayed me. This I feel was discrimination based on sex and retaliation for taking leave to recover from pregnancy. I will discuss the effects of the Office of Human Rights timing and delay for my case on myself and family and also address the lack of clear communication. On October the 27th, 2017, I submitted my first charge. It took up to three months to schedule for an intake interview. 
To this day, it has been three years since the rebuttal has been submitted. After the summer of 2021, I was told that it would be finished. Once the follow-up happened, the, no determination was made. Due to so many delays, my family was forced to relocate to Alabama. As a result, my case was neglected for three years. This made me feel as if I was not worthy. This caused me low self-esteem and made me feel as if I was not important. If I had the help of OHR, and if they came to my aid, I would have felt like I was a human with rights. This treatment from OHR impacted my self-esteem. And it came directly after giving birth to my son, which was a very big change in my life. With the large change also came the loss of my job and then the neglect from OHR. These experiences affected my mental health and caused me to feel very depressed and helpless. Since all of this occurred, the financial hardship faced by my family has put a strain on my relationship leading me to seek mental health counseling. I would like the OHR to take my case seriously by providing a determination that is fair and also compensates me for the inconvenience I've incurred for over three years. My only fault was believing in this system, although I feel like it has neglected me. Any delays that happen with any individuals who submit paperwork to OHR is not fair. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, William Lightfoot, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson White and members of the council. My name is William Lightfoot. I am an attorney in private practice representing people who are injured, who suffer physical injury where they've actually had to go see a doctor. I have represented many people who are injured on the job but very rarely will I represent someone who's a DC government worker who was injured. And the reason I restrain from representing injured DC government workers is because the system itself is rigged, it is unfair, and it, it is unjust. And I have found that unless I use some kind of political influence, it is almost impossible to get justice for a DC government injured worker because the system is so rigged. I'm going to suggest to you some reforms that I would like to you and your leadership role to consider, as well as other members of the council. Uh, you're going to hear that we in DC have a system where injured workers who have suffered similar injuries are not treated equally. If the person's in the federal government, they're treated better than a worker, injured worker in the DC government. If the injured workers in the private sector, they're treated better than an injured worker in the federal sector or in the DC public sector. But those workers we're talking about today, those workers in the DC public sector, they are treated the worst of all. It's shameful. You're gonna hear testimony from a woman whose husband was catastrophically injured while working on a trash truck. You're gonna hear testimony from her that she is aware that there was a cover up by the Office of Risk Management to cover up the dangerous conditions that existed on the job that caused her husband's injuries. You're gonna hear her testify about her benefit structure and how low it is compared to what her husband was making at the time of the injury compared to the subsistence allowance he gets now. And you're gonna hear her talk about how she feels like she and her family have been treated like the trash that her husband used to, used to pick up because the people at ORM have been so callous in their management of the medical treatment for her husband. You're gonna hear testimony from a lawyer in a few moments who's studied this system for years he and others have drafted a bill titled the Injured Workers Equality Act. Um, he will, his name is Ben Douglas. He will present that to you. We would ask you to consider introducing it. You're gonna hear testimony from another lawyer who's gonna talk about the differences in the federal system and the DC system. And again, how ORM has acted unethically, um, improperly, and in a callous manner. Now you will hear that in the private sector for injured workers, the statute has a humanitarian purpose to help the worker get better, to help the worker return to work. You're gonna hear in ORM, the way it administers it, this current system is simply to make it a cost cutting factor, terminate somebody's benefits and the government saves money, cut off somebody's health insurance to reduce their medical care, the government saves money. That's a, a very wrong, unfair, unjust um, position. And lastly, you're going to hear about the unethical contacts between the Office of OAG and ORM. 
Um, all of this, we'd ask you to take some action as follows. One, we would ask you to use your budgetary authority during the Budget Act to transfer resources and authority from the Office of Risk Management to the Department of Employment Services so that we can have a system that treats similar workers with similar injuries in a similar manner. DOES could have improvement, but at least they do better than ORM. We would also ask you to introduce the legislation that Mr. Douglas will talk to you about. We would ask you to investigate further this question of the, um, the cover-up uh, that Ms. Colbert's gonna testify with respect to her husband. And lastly, we would ask you to create a working group of those stakeholders in the public worker system who can come together and make recommendations for the government to improve the system. With that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for your time and attention. Oh, thank you very much. Our final public witness for this panel is uh, Benjamin Douglas. Um, thank you, council member. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Lightfoot. Um, before I start, uh, the 11th witness, uh, Robert Taylor, is not available till 3.30. Council member, I don't know if that would be too late to take a public. Um, as stated, my name is Benjamin Douglas. Um, thank you to council member. Thank you to the other members of the committee. Um, I am an attorney who specializes in representing injured workers. I mainly work in the private sector system in DC. I handle some cases in the public sector system and I have done that. Um, for several years now. I'm testifying to register my discontent with the Office of Risk Management, its violations of the rights of injured workers, and its disrespect for the rule of law. As stated, DC's public sector system is distinct from the private sector system. It is inferior in nearly, nearly all respects. There is no reason for DC to have two separate sets of rights for these two sets of injured workers. Um, there are many illustrations I could talk about um, an injured worker in the private sector has a right to choose their own doctor. A public sector worker does not. Um, there is a presumption that a, a, an injury falls under the act. So there's a presumption of compensability in the private sector act. There's nothing of that in the public sector act. In the private sector act, uh, an injured worker or an employer and insurer can request a hearing when there's a dispute. Um, in the public sector act, the injured worker is entirely at the mercy of the program in terms of even having a right to go to court over uh, disputed rights. Um, one illustrative uh, difference is the burden of proof question. What the system does in the public sector is that they issue a notice of determination, that's Office of Risk Management does, and then the injured worker has to appeal it if it's adverse as it usually is. The Compensation Review Board, which is the appellate body for these, these sets of laws, placed the initial burden on the program to show that the system has changed, the condition has changed. ORM's response to this, uh, since it passed its uh, new regulations, it promulgated its new regulations in 2017, is effectively to try to ignore this holding and the subsequent holdings that this is the law. They claim in every case, that the burden is actually, according to the regulations, on the claimant to show that their condition has not changed. Um, that's very unorthodox. The Court of Appeals has ruled to the contrary, but every single time they simply state the same thing. ORM treats the matter as though they define the law and are not subject to the judgments of the courts. Um, there's also an issue of disobeying orders. Um, their legal aid has testified about this before. They've secured judgments on behalf of their clients and it's simply been disobeyed. Um, I've had that happen as well. I was representing a sanitation worker in a vehicle which flipped. Um, he suffered serious injuries. They terminated his benefits um, and we went to a hearing and we secured the retroactive benefits. They never paid him a dime of that. They stated that a provision regarding paperwork, regarding forfeiture for failure to complete paperwork, meant that they could retroactively deduct any benefits that were owed and claim that he owed them money rather than vice versa, even after an administrative law judge had ordered them to pay him money. Um, on paper, there are some provisions to secure penalties, to secure default. In practice, they do not pan out in the public sector system. Um, the hurdles are insuperable. And the result is that Years go by, 
um, where people don't get the benefits they secure. And people can't secure counsel for a number of reasons, one of which is that what's attorneys don't know the point of going to court if one side's simply going to disobey what the judge says. Um, it is to call it a frustrating system and a frustrating arrangement is an understatement. Um, I also want to note we've we've addressed this issue before, um, before the council and uh, Jed Ross, the director of RM, has stated his reasons why he thinks that the, the public sector system is preferable. Um, I'm glad to discuss this point by point, but in some of these comments, a number of these comments, uh, it does not appear to reflect an accurate understanding of what the private sector system uh, includes, the rights that injured workers have in the private sector system, how medical benefits are arranged. Um, I can elaborate on that at length, um, if need be, point by point, but any claim that the public sector system is superior with a few very small caveats um, is demonstrably false. Um, ultimately, although I am very dissatisfied with what ORM has done and is doing, some of this responsibility lies with the council. In Mr. Ross's own words, the mission of the Office of Risk Management is to reduce the probability, occurrence, and cost of risk to the District of Columbia government. In this sense, ORM is like the DC government's insurance company for tort cases and for workers' compensation cases. The problem in the, in the uh, public sector workers' compensation system is that they also have claimed for themselves the right to adjudicate benefits and the right to write the regulations that govern the system. And finally, and less lawlessly, to allow those to claim that those regulations trump what the uh, the statute and the courts actually say. Mr. Douglas, you're about a but, minute and a half over your time. So I would ask that you just kind of summarize briefly uh, your, your closing. Uh, appreciate your patience. Um, I ask you, council member, and the other members of the committee to pass the Injured Workers uh, Equality Amendment Act of 2022. No other state really has a two-tier system like this. DC should simply get rid of it and give the same rights to public sector workers that are granted to private sector workers. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to, to everyone for the, from this panel. Uh, testimonies were, were, were pretty clear. So I don't have a ton of questions, but, but I do have some. Mr. Syndrome, are you uh, still with us? Uh, President Carter for Mr. Chair. Wonderful. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I do hope we'll have a, a permanent director uh, for uh, the Office on Human Rights soon. Um, you know, the, the reason I, I wanted a, uh, a term limit on the director was because I had uh, concerns with the, uh, the, 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 the track record of the mayor's appointee. It was someone who had led the office before. Uh, the office had significant issues. I, I didn't want to try to attribute them all to uh, to her, but you know, it was hard to to divorce the issues from uh, from that director. Uh, but 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 you believe that the office should permanently have a term limit on the director. Why do you believe this would be uh, good for the office? Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, as you pointed out, a previous director who then ran for office and lost, and then contrary to the hiring freeze, of DC was rehired. All right, the promoted agenda, not of we the people, but that of the status quo monarchical elitists. So a term limit would, would better best monitor the wrongdoing, the irreparable harm that's inured to we the people jointly, severally, collectively, and individually. And um, the issue which I brought to the forefront previously of merit, merit needs to weigh in. The directors currently have tie-ins to the uh, executive branch, plain and simple. And the director previously, too, was not vetted as the law requires. There should be a nationwide search for the best candidate, the best in terms of merit, who's best qualified, not who you know, but what you know. And that has not happened. Um, additionally, I, I wanted to bring your attention, uh, Mr. Chair, in the Human Rights Act, there is a provision for injunctive relief. It's under D.C. Code uh, Section 2-1403.07. That has rarely, if ever, been used. Uh, it comes under housing for the most part. Of course, we have a, a foreclosure moratorium eviction at the moment. But in terms of employment, I, I think uh, 
the rest of the um, uh, panelists could, could concur. When, when you're losing your job, that's time sensitive. That's irreparable harm. And that's where the, um, the, the injunctive relief should kick in. I'm sure Mr. Lightfoot could, could concur. So that's something that uh, uh, needs to be asked of the current administration and the ones coming on board. To make I, I appreciate that. Let, let me get a few other uh, questions. And uh, Susie yeah, McClanahan, sure. you, you mentioned the, uh, that the uh, Office of Human Rights is refusing to accept a disparate uh, impact claims. Is, is this, uh, is this uh, in their statute? Is this case law? Where, where is uh, the, this requirement? So disparate impact is, you know, a type of discrimination. I don't know where they, I don't know the rationale that OHR is using to dismiss these complaints, but when we tried to file one in October last year, they refused to accept it. I'm, I'm sorry, let me clarify. You, you, your testimony was that they're supposed to accept disparate impact claims. Um, it, it, wh why do you believe they are supposed to accept disparate Sure. Impact? Thank you for clarifying. My apologies. So the DC Office of Human Rights is supposed to accept um, is considered a substantial, substantively equivalent agency to HUD, which is why it is able to process complaints um, that would otherwise be filed and investigated by HUD. As part of that, um, the Fair Housing Act recognizes disparate impact theory as a type of complaint. And with the agency supposed to be substantively equivalent, we filed a race-based complaint at the agency, but it refused to accept it. Did they did they give an analysis uh, or justification uh, for this? They said simply it was a capacity issue. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I have some uh, some questions for them uh, on this. So I, I intend to dig into this uh, with them today. I, I appreciate you raising it and also letting us know ahead of time so we could uh, start to 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 sort through it. Um, uh, Tyrone Hanley. Uh, you, you mentioned concerns, among other things, with delays in hiring. Uh, they have also had, though, some uh, a good amount of turnover. A lot of, you know, everybody has for the most part. Uh, and so um, it, it seems like, you know, sort of delays or no delays. They, I think they have a good number of vacancies now. Um, you know, do you have... Um, do, do you, and I apologize if this was in your testimony, do you know what caused the, the delay in hiring? No, I honestly do not. And so that's why I don't feel like I can fully speak on that, but I know right. that is it a, a, a factor in this. I, I, you know, I by far don't want to give the impression like that is the only cause, but I just want to point that specific piece out. Okay. I, I appreciate that. Um, and I, and I have some some questions for them on sort of hiring and, and turnover uh, that I'm going to run through as well. Uh, Emily Chong, uh, do, 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 you, do you know what the, the agency's justification is for not accepting attorney drafted charges? So in our advocates meeting with the um with the interim director of Office of Human Rights, she just says they strive to accept attorney drafted charges, but that they, you know, stopped the pilot program in 2019 and, you know, don't have plans to renew it. And so we didn't receive any justification on why the pilot program isn't being renewed. And, you know, I, we appreciate that they strive to accept attorney drafted charges, but in my experience, in, you know, Ms. D's case, they do not accept attorney drafted charges. I don't even know what strive to accept means. Like, um, I feel like you accept it or you don't. Uh, do you have, I mean, I'm lost here. Do you have any insights? I, I, my impression was that, you know, they try to accept as much of it as possible, but, you know, in my experience, they do not, you know, they do a five month, back, five week back and forth. Interesting. Okay. Um, With respect to uh, creating separate complaints for each charge, uh, regardless of whether you agree uh, with, with it or not, is there, is, there, is, is there a reason that this might make sense for them in any way? I think the times where it might make sense are, for example, it's completely different topics. So, you know, if someone were to submit 
a complaint of housing discrimination and then a complaint of employment discrimination for their employer, then of course there should be separate charges because it's two separate. Mm -hmm. So I would think, you know, that would be the example where it would make sense, which is why, um, you know, at first shift, we believe it should be a single charge only for situations where it's the same um, fact pattern, the same factual circumstances. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're suggesting where it's the same fact pattern, it, that's where it it makes sense to combine them when the when the okay, okay. or it stems from the same fact. Yeah. For example, you know, three months of you know discrimination from the same employer that would be a similar enough fact pattern. Are Are you aware of any other tribunals that that operate this way that require uh, complainants to separate out all complaints? Yes. So at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, they uh, they do. Um, oh, sorry. Did you say separate complaints or did you say single charges? A separate. Oh, for separate charges, EO, uh, EOC does a single charge. So I'm not, okay. That's helpful. Yeah, I'm not aware of um, any uh, commission that does separate charges, and I know EOC is in charge of overseeing around seven different laws, and so I'm sure they have complaints with, you know, uh, multiple laws, but that are all in the single charge. Okay. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned uh, a case where it took over three years to receive a letter of determination. Where in the process was the, the, the longest delay or were the longest delays? So the three years was actually the time from when we submitted our rebuttal to mm -hmm the letter of determination and so oh. the longest it was actually I think four years since the charge was filed so the time that it took was the investigation time and I believe a huge chunk of it was also the time it's taking for um, the office of general counsel to review the letter of determination after drafting um Alana um Eichner you mentioned, I just want to check a, uh, a stat that you mentioned that the average salary for domestic workers is twenty to $25,000. I can't remember which. Uh, yeah, which. this is data from the Economic Policy Institute from 2019. They're using five years worth of American community survey data. And this is for domestic workers who work in D.C. And they found that the average median salary is $25,888. Okay. And is this for, for full-time or is this like a mix of full-time and part-time? Do you happen to know? Um, I don't know for sure, but my sense is that it's a combination of, uh, for a lot of domestic workers, several different jobs that are part-time, some, some that are full-time. I think nannies and home care workers are a little more likely to be employed full-time, but a lot of times it's piecing together several part-time jobs and that's equaling around 25,000 as a median. Okay. Um, Raina, uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your testimony. Um, I know that um, I believe my colleague who chairs the Labor Committee is, is, is working on a bill uh, now. We've been engaged uh, with her office on this, and, and your testimony is, is helpful in helping us uh, unpack uh, some of the issues, although I, I regret hearing uh, many of the things that you that you testify to, uh, nobody should be, uh, you know, treated inhumanely or taken advantage of because of their uh, discrimination status. And so, uh, I do hear you on on the need to make sure uh, the protections uh, that you were talking about uh, do exist in in law. So, I'll continue working with my my colleague, Councilmember Silverman, uh, on that bill. And my hope is that we'll we'll get that to uh, get that done. Muchas gracias por escucharme. Thank you. Uh, Keisha Jones, I just wanted to check one fact in your uh, testimony. Um, you, you filed your case uh, three years ago. Have you received the final determination? Did it take three years or you filed it three years ago and you're still waiting? So I submitted the charge in 2017 and I'm still waiting for the determination. And uh, do you know what uh, what the specific holdups have, have been or where, where, where it has been stuck? 
not to my knowledge, I was told that I would get a determination during the summer of last year. So you reach out to them and they say, oh, it's coming, just wait. And that's about all the information you can you can get. Exactly. Okay, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, we, we do have some questions about their timelines. That's, I mean, that's a long time to be waiting and, and, and to have no sort of real uh, information about where, where things are, how much longer it's really gonna take. Uh, that, that, that is difficult to hear. So, so we, we will work through that with the agency and I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that. Thank you, I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, so uh, Mr. Lightfoot and Mr. Douglas, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to hearing some of the other uh, folks you mentioned. <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll be testifying. I know we have some testimony that has been submitted already as well. So we will make sure um, we go through that. Just one quick clarification, um, Mr. Douglas, where you were talking about ORM disobeying orders. Can, can you uh, just run that through again? What, what was the order and what did ORM uh, essentially do there? Something with a re retroactive order. Um. Council member, thank you. There, there are several instances of this. I think legal aid has the most egregious. That was a number of years, but um, there's a report of earnings requirement under the act um, that states that an employee forfeits their earnings if they don't give the, um, the response to the request in time. Um, and, but what RM did was they didn't seek to forfeit earnings um, at the time that the report was due, mm -hmm. um, fill this paperwork out this time or else. They just let it sit. And then when we got an order stating that he was disabled and they had to pay this sum, they said, well, you know, it's, this was a 27, this would have been, I believe 2018. They said, well, you didn't fill it out uh, 18 months ago. Therefore, even though the judge ordered us to pay this, we're going to deduct all the sums that were ordered to pay and forfeit them retroactively in accordance with this law because you didn't fill out the paperwork properly a, a year and a half ago. And therefore that money is owed to us and we're gonna claim a credit until you said it right. Um, there are other examples. Um, one is that the regulations say that they don't have to pay while an appeal is pending. That's another difference in the private sector act. Mm -hmm. So they can just appeal, appeal, appeal. Um, that's technically legal, but unfair. Um, but there are other examples, um, and mine is by far, uh, or far from the only one, but that's what happened in that particular case of mine. Okay. In, in the private sector, they, ha they have to pay before the appeal? They have to pay within 10 days of the order, even if appeal's pending. Uh -huh. um, if there's a reversal of the benefits, then they, they cease payment. Um, but that prevents them from an insurance company can't use the strategy of just appeal every time, appeal, appeal, yeah. um, and delay it months and months um, as long as there's any dispute about any legal issue. Okay. Oh, well, thank you very much. I, I want to uh, thank everybody from uh, from this panel uh, for, for your testimonies and, and for being with us today. Uh, we're going to- Mr. Chair, to piggyback just about disobedience uh, on a okay. settlement agreement. Eight, Please eight go eight. ahead. I'm going to be brief though, because we do have another uh, panel yeah. of folks. Yep. Thank you, sir. On a settlement agreement uh, that requires a functional on-site building officer uh, condominium from 8808, it still has yet to be enforced. Ms. Khan and others have just flipped their nose, and they're not honoring the settlement agreement, not enforcing a disobedience. And I did want to give uh, Sean Cuddyhay um, high marks for very, being very helpful and supportive uh, and providing the information to connect with you. And I want to thank him on the record. I appreciate it. I, I know he does as well. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Central. Thanks to, to everyone uh, on this panel. We're going to move to our, our next um, panel of public witnesses, starting with uh, Robert Taylor, Jamila Grooms, Natasha, Natasha Riddle Romero, Yannick Amixon, um, um, John Gibson. Steve Kaminsky, Shanice Haynes, Columbus Presley, April Dyson, Samantha Machete, Ayesa Clay.
Robert Taylor, are you with us? How about Jamila Grooms? Okay, hold on, let me give. Okay, we will go to Natasha Romero. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chairman White, uh, members in the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. My name is Natasha Riddle Romero, and I am the bilingual community organizer at Under 3 DC and a member of the DC Language Access Coalition. My testimony today will focus on the Office of Human Rights Language Access Program. Um, I work primarily with Spanish speaking child care providers and early educators who rely heavily on the district's various services and programs to provide for care for children. One of the main agencies that providers and educators interact with is Aussie. For the past year, I have been helping LEP, Limited English Proficient Providers, navigate an incredibly complex licensing and monitoring system at Aussie. We have also been advocating for more provider participation in the child care subsidy program at Aussie, which allows low income families to access high quality care. Many district families, particularly LEP immigrants, cannot access culturally competent subsidized care near their homes. While early educators are finally getting the recognition they deserve with the general generous investment in ECA salary increases, I am concerned that there is not enough investment in the language access program at OHR, which helps to improve language services at each DC agency. Without more investment for OHR to expand its complaint monitoring and investigation ability and enforce the language access law, LEP communities have no recourse for language access violations. District agencies are required to comply with the law, but can get by with the bare minimum. Over the past six months, the least DC Language Access Coalition and the Under 3 DC Coalition have been working together to address some of these systemic issues at Aussie. Rosa Carillo and her team at OHR have been extremely proactive in addressing these gaps. Due partly to our efforts in Aussie's internal changes at the Department of Early Learning, we have been able to take the complaints we hear from providers in the field to Aussie, which has resulted in some action, but it is not enough. DCLAC and Under 3DC would not have been able to truly delve deep into the issue of language access at Aussie without the firsthand accounts of LEP community and the help of OHR. However, the Department of Early Learning at Aussie is just the tip of the iceberg. Unfortunately, the only resource to eliminate language access gaps or encourage change within agencies is a very small team of three people at OHR. The language access program at OHR needs more funding to hire more staff to increase their capacity to encourage agencies to improve their language access resources. They also need to expand their partnerships with community organizations to inform the LAP community about their language rights. Finally, they also need to hire an advising attorney to ensure agencies are compliant with the law and that violations are taken seriously. As of now, a language access complaint submitted by an individual whose language rights were violated could take up to one year to address. This has led to extreme underreporting of violations. Why would an LEP person issue a complaint if little to no recourse exists to ensure their rights are not violated again? The lack of impact from the complaint process has created a deep cultural fissure between LEP communities and DC government programs and services. The truth is that DC is very behind where it needs to be to be truly inclusive of, of its LEP residents. Improvements to the language access program at OHR are just a start. Once those improvements are made, OHR can begin to address some of the systemic gaps in language access with the help of the LEP community. Thanks for your time and consideration, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yannick uh, Amikton. Please yep. forgive me if I mispronounced your name, and please correct me. You got that exactly right. Thank yeah. You. Thank you, Council Member. Um, good afternoon, Council Member White, uh, members of the Committee on Government Operations Facilities. My name is Yannick Omikton. Uh, and I am the Economic Justice Program Coordinator at Many Languages, One Voice, uh, or MLOVE. Uh, we work toward full language and economic justice in DC for uh, DC's immigrant populations. Many of you are familiar with MLOVE's work because we've been around in some form since the inception of DC's groundbreaking Language Access Act uh, and lead the DC Language Access Coalition, helping OHR enforce our robust language access laws. 
Um, like my colleague Natasha from other organization uh, has already testified, while our language access laws are powerful and unique, their enforcement is chronically underfunded and language access problems continue to run rampant through DC's public facing agencies. A major component of the economic justice program at MLove is assisting LEP and NEP immigrants in DC with public benefits applications. In this capacity, I've assisted folks with Stay DC, Food Stamps, LIHEAP, ERAP, and other essential applications. Folks come to me because when they apply for these resources elsewhere, in person, for example, uh, at DHS sites or online, they have questions they can't get answered in a language they understand. So I lost my place. Um, or they felt discriminated against on the basis of the language they speak. Uh, or they've received inadequate assistance from translation services. We're not talking about obscure languages here. We're talking about Spanish and Amharic, languages that should at the very, very, very minimum be well represented in the staff at every major public facing agency. Often MLOV members tell me that they wait hours in line and are told at the end of that line that the interpreter left for the day or that the agency doesn't have the capacity to serve them. If they get lucky in the staff call language line as they're required to do normally, some of them use the little English they know to figure out that the language line interpreter isn't conveying the right information. Important applications themselves are also often not translated into other languages until we specifically bring up these problems to the corresponding agencies, such as in the case of CDC. Some of our members are over at today's other hearing at, at the uh, Committee for Human Services testifying about these very issues, but this doesn't just happen at DHS sites. We've heard these stories about the DMV, about DC Health, OSSI, DCRA, DC Public Schools, and organizations and clinics that receive DC money, where these cases are all too common. OHR receives a handful of language access complaints every year, no more than 20. But I've received around 40 stories of discrimination and unfair treatment from public agencies in the past three months alone. Many people don't know about their right to complain through OHR, and many are apprehensive about the process, believing it to be futile or not worth their time. We are helping them, but our own organization is constrained by capacity. I absolutely want to commend OHR for their efforts thus far in resolving the cases they've had to handle and for their communication with organizations working toward language justice. DHS rolled out an entirely new combined application for major public benefits, District Direct, without having translated any portion of the online process in major languages like Spanish and Amharic. And Rosa Carillo and her two colleagues have been working diligently to resolve this egregious language access oversight. But OHR is stuck playing whack-a-mole with half a hammer, with a team of three people scurrying around to handle a bevy of language access issues that, frankly, 18 years following the passage of the Language Access Act are absolutely unacceptable. Furthermore, the Language Access Act uh, enforcement falls extremely disproportionately on organizations uh, like the one I work for. OHR's capacity to spread the word about language access rights is highly limited, and cases literally can take up to a year to resolve. Most of us are doing this work without funding from DC. It is deeply troubling that the community has more capacity to enforce DC's human rights laws than DC's own, own human rights enforcement wing, and that has been the case for nearly two decades. We want to make sure that OHR has the resources it needs to fully enforce the Language Access Act. Like, like my colleague at DC Action, Natasha Romero, mentioned, OHR has communicated specific needs to its community partners. More staff, especially an advising attorney, and more funding for community partnerships. I want to make sure that someone from this committee receives a firm answer from OHR today about the dollar amount of resources they believe they would need to meet language access needs across DC. And then I would highly recommend that we invest that money in the Budget Oversight Committee. We also have to have a broader conversation about language access across agencies. A surefire way to, for OHR to gain more capacity is for other agencies to actually abide by the Language Access Act in the first place. After 18 years and several underfunded amendments, it is high time that agencies have more robust plans for language access to at least, at least hire bilingual personnel and proactively translate all information in major covered languages. This theme must be carried through during budget oversight as well. Thank you so much for your time today, council members, and I look forward to hearing more about this issue soon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have, uh, sorry, Jamila Grooms. Welcome. Good afternoon, council members and DC public. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you just fine, thanks. Oh. And thank you because I'm just leaving a doctor's appointment. So this is like, <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for my ride. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get to it. Um, my name is Jamila Groom um, and I'm a resident of Ward 1. I lived in DC for 39 years. I am a mother, daughter, sister, community advocate, volunteer and tax paying citizen. Also, I am a returning citizen of the District of Columbia. 
I am an advocate for employment opportunities for returning citizens like myself. I formerly work with the National Reentry Network for Returning Citizens, an organization that supports returning citizens in Washington, D.C. I am now studying to go back to school to get an advanced degree to further help my community. I know firsthand how important employment is for folks who are returning home after spending time in prison or jail. After D.C. passes Ban the Box Law, a law which provides employment protections for job applicants with arrest and conviction records. I was the first person to file a complaint of a ban the box violation in 2015. The law passed in December of 2014 and in February of 2015, I filed my first complaint with the Office of Human Rights. That's right, when I submitted my complaint, the OHR mediator told me that I was the very first person to ever file a complaint under the Band of Box law. I was proud to be the first one to make sure that the law lived up to its promise. After I filed and won my initial complaint, during the remainder of that year, I filed nine more complaints and won them all too. The law was very new and employers were violating it openly. I appreciated OHR's enforcement of the law. Nearly all of the complaints I filed typically, typically took no more than three to five months from filing the complaint to receiving my determination letter. There was one case in particular that had to go through conciliation, and I believe that took about eight months from start to finish. However, more recently, I have been disappointed, very disappointed in OHR's enforcement of, of this law. Most recently, I filed a ban the box complaint with OHR in January of 2020. In May of 2020, my case went to mediation, but it was not resolved. The, invest the investigation continued after that. In September of 2020, we submitted a rebuttal response to HR. In November of 2020, I answered a series of written questions posed by, o by the OHR investigator. In November of 2020 was also the last time I heard any substantial update on my case. My attorney has inquired with OHR on my behalf many times. In May of 2021, we learned that my case had been forwarded to the OHR Office of General Counsel for legal review and determination. When we asked about the specific time frame for this review, we were given no time frame at all and just told, thank you for your continued patience. In August of 2021, we were, we were again told there were no updates. We were instructed that if there was still no news within 90 days, that we should contact the OHR investigator again. In November of 2021, after 90 days had passed, we again contacted OHR's investigator. We were not giving any further updates except to be told that the complaint was still under legal review. It is now February 2022. 2022. It has been two years since I filed my initial complaint. I still have not received a determination. The delay has been incredibly frustrating. The company against whom I filed the complaint has presumably been operating in the same way it did before I filed the complaint. I have been given no reason. Sorry, I have been given no reason for the cause of the delay, and no promise that my complaint will be resolved within a certain time frame. The only thing that OHR has told me is that I have to keep waiting patiently. This is not a good way to enforce the law or make sure that returning citizens aren't facing discrimination. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and uh, appreciate you being with us. Our, our next uh, public witness is uh, John Gibson. Uh, let's move to Steve Kaminsky. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Chair White and members of the committee. I'm Stephen H. Kaminsky, an attorney in private practice 
in the District of Columbia, and I'm here representing the Trial Lawyers Association of Metropolitan Washington, DC. For over 20 years, <clears throat> my practice has included representing workers' compensation claimants, people who have been injured, before the Department of Employment Services, but rarely before the Office of Risk Management. And I'm pleased to be here to speak today uh, about why I rarely represent claimants before our ORM and how it reflects ORM's failure to fairly adjudicate public employees' workers' compensation claims. Currently, the public and private sector workers' compensation systems in the district are separate. This separation needlessly creates a class of workers who, because they work for the public sector, are given less access to justice than private sector employees. Our Court of Appeals has said that the purpose of the workers' compensation system <clears throat> is to advance the humanitarian goal of providing compensation benefits to employees for work-related disabilities in a reasonably expeditious manner, and even in arguable cases. The current public sector system as administered by ORM does not comport with this purpose. For example, private sector injured employees enjoy a system where cases are handled in a largely efficient manner. Injured workers have a right to choo choose their own treating physician. The doctor-patient relationship is maintained partly on the patient's trust and confidence in their doctor. And that's why it's crucial that an injured worker be allowed to choose their own treating physician. And this is simply not the case in the public sector system where workers are forced to choose a doctor off a, uh, a list maintained by the Office of Risk Management. Currently, public sector employees such as teachers, first responders, and agency employees are forced into a system that is inefficient with inherent conflicts of interest since the Office of Risk Management self-administers all claims, issues all regulations, and determines the physician that an injured worker must choose. In private sector cases, an injured worker can request a hearing before an administrative law judge where when any dispute arises concerning a claim for benefits owed to the worker. However, in public sector cases, uh, public sector workers are denied this, this important right. For years, following a decision to deny or withhold payment on a claim, ORM simply refused to issue notice of determination letters, a prerequisite for an injured worker to seek an appeal with the Office of Administrative Hearings. In situations where the notice of determination was eventually issued and a worker received a hearing with a result favorable to the injured worker, the district can undermine the result by simply filing a motion refusing to pay the claim on the basis that to do so would be a burden to the district. Now, the reason why I rarely choose to represent public sector claimants is, and very few attorneys actually do, uh, is due to the problems in adjudicating claims. Fixing this current broken system to allow attorneys to represent claimants in a fair and on a level playing field would be good for the public sector employees as it would allow more access to justice and produce more just results. It would actually benefit the administrative law judges who are fact finders at the Department of Employment Services because attorney involvement would further increase the efficiency of handling claims as claimants would have the assistance of counsel in preparing their claim. And the courts would certainly appreciate attorneys who are knowledgeable in the practice area, presenting evidence in an efficient, coherent manner at the hearing. The current system is not the way our government should treat hardworking district employed citizens. There should be significant reforms to the process and procedure to make this process more efficient and just for claimants in the District of Columbia. Thank you, Chair White. Thank you very much. Next public witness is uh, Shanice Haynes. Yes. Hi. Welcome. Hello. Okay, so good evening, members of the committee and council member. My name is Shanice Hanks, and I'm here to testify about my experience with the Public Sector Workers' Compensation Program, Office of Risk Management. I work for Luke Seymour, D.C. Public High School, as an attendance counselor. However, I was regularly assigned tasks outside of my scope of duties as an attendance counselor by the principal, but as that put my health and safety at risk. I previously had an incident with a student wherein I was physically assaulted, specifically while at work. I was slammed to the ground and bashed in my face multiple times by a student. The most recent incident was when I was traumatized again mentally and suffered injuries to my right knee. 
This assault has caused ongoing problems with my knee, and I still have nightmares of these incidents. I have been referred to several doctors for treatment. In December 2021, my treating physician requested that I get an MRI and recommended physical therapy for my knee. On December 20th, 2021, my three-year-old daughter tested positive for COVID-19. I advised the claims examiner, Ms. Robinson, who was handling my case of the situation. Additionally, I provided the claims examiner with the positive COVID-19 test result provided by my daughter's doctor, and I stated that I was a primary caregiver for my daughter. Moreover, I explained that I was experiencing some symptoms associated with COVID-19, and I will follow up with my doctor and follow COVID-19 quarantine guidelines. Due to the COVID-19 related symptoms I was experiencing, I asked if the claims examiner to temporarily postpone my physical therapy and MRI, which she stated I had to go to or I would be out of compliance. I explained in a pandemic, I have the responsibility to truthfully answer COVID questionnaires so that I'm not spreading a, de a deadly disease that claimed the lives of millions. The claims examiner agreed to reschedule. I was astounded to be sent a notice that I would be denied benefits for a month with no pay. I was informed that by postponing my treatment, I was not being cooperative. I was further advised that a copy of my COVID diagnosis was never received. I must emphasize that I sent a copy of my COVID, my daughter, excuse me, COVID um, diagnosis to Ms. Robinson. Later, I was sent another notice stating my benefits would be reinstated except for the time I was quarantined. I lost income. I mean, the loss income has resulted in significant financial hardship and has caused me to fall behind in paying my bills. I feel that my case was not properly handled. It appears as though the Office of Risk Management wants workers to choose between spreading COVID or getting an income. I was further informed that I could not qualify for treatment for the mental trauma I received from the attacks while at work. I was advised that my insurance would have to cover any behavior behavioral health treatment for it. I respectfully request the committee to hold the program accountable and push for real change to this inhumane system. People matter and mental health matters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, John Gibson. Thank you, Council Member White, good to see you again. Thank you good for your time. <laughs> Uh, my name is John Gibson. I'm president of Teamsters Local 639 here in Washington, D.C. We have over 10,000 members across D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. We represent many of the frontline workers facing high risk in this pandemic. I'm speaking today to express my dissatisfaction with the job performance of the Office of Risk Management. The Office of Risk Management represents the D.C. government in tort and workers' compensation matters. It's something like the district's insurance company. However, at the same time, ORM also acts as the agency charged with administering the public sector's workers' compensation system, writing its regulations, and in many cases, adjudicating the claims. This creates a conflict of interest where ORM acts as both the adjudicator and one of the parties, and as one of the parties. This is not only injustice, it is also completely unnecessary. There is no reason to have separate systems for public and private sector systems. Virginia and Maryland do not have unequal rights for public and private workers. DC's private sector system delivers better benefits at lower costs than either neighboring state. And I ask the council to offer the same rights to private sector workers as those offered to public sector workers. Local 639 is in a distinct position to appreciate the gulf between the two workers' compensation systems. We represent both private and public sector workers. I have seen firsthand with members of our local how different the two systems are and how much worse the public sector system is. In some cases, these workers may work physically right next to each other. Local 639 represents some of the DC public school employees and employees of Sodexo, which is the food service workers working in DC public schools. Imagine these employees who work alongside of each other in the same union, asking about their rights if they get injured at work. Can an injured worker receive treatment from a physician of their choosing? If they work for a private company, yes. If they work for the district government, no. 
if the workers' compensation insurer delays in authorizing requested treatment or benefits without issuing a formal denial, can the worker request a hearing to pressure them? If they work for a private company, yes, they can. If they work for the district government, no. If the nightmare scenario occurs and the work injury incapacitates them for the rest of their life, can they get permanent total disability? If they work for a private company, yes, they can. If they work for the district government, no. If they recover and get back to work, but they continue to have problems with the functioning of an arm or a leg, who determines if they get disability schedule award? If they work for a, comp a private company, an impartial ALJ, administrative law judge decides. If they work for the district government, the ORM decides. The same people who are paying the award decides the amount. I'm testifying here today to ask the council to abolish the system and to give DC government employees equal rights when they suffer workplace injuries. Thank you for your time, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Our next uh, public witness is April Dyson. Oh, good afternoon, um, Council Member um, White. Uh, thank you for um, allowing um, us to testify on behalf of ORM. And so first I wanna um, tell you that um, uh, my name is April Dyson. I am an attorney, but I am also a claimant or used to be a claimant. My claim year ended January, 2019. But um, pursuant to my public testimony, I want to be sure to um, inform you about Mr. Ross and his illegal activities. So I also uh, worked for DCRA or still work for DCRA, but apparently Mr. Ross has created some type of um, form 50s that are illegal. And on the forms it says, uh, ORM told him, told them to terminate him. Mr. Ross used to work for DCRA in the personnel department uh, before he came to um, ORM. Uh, no one, and when I say no one, has been able to help me to unravel this whole um, episode. But uh, my public testimony will surely show that it was Mr. Ross who decided that I was terminated, not DCRA. And people are still asking me, in fact, your um, committee asked me, did I still work for DCRA? Because technically, I'm still a DC employee, just no place to go. I also want to tell you about the trouble I have had as a result. I have paid for all of my um, work-related injuries because they, at the time they didn't have a female qualified panel doctor. And when I paid for them all, they refused to reimburse me. I have um, sent um, for the public record, uh, letters from um, then I think uh, Mr. Lattimore, he was the director before Mr. Ross, where they have received them, but they have taken no action based on my, uh, my uh, certification that these are my, uh, these are my injuries. And these are the treatment that I sought. And I will say that I think I have gotten much better treatment because I treated with my private insurance versus the government providing me treatment. So, but I also paid the price because my premiums went up because they have paid so much money as a result of them paying for my work related. They also have um, sent letters to ORM asking for reimbursement and apparently they just ignored them. Um, when Mr. Ross came to ORM, he, uh, in 2015, Immediately I was, uh, my benefits were suspended after they sent me to the wrong address for an IME. And, and in, in, in order to try to get my case dismissed, they also um, altered a document with my name on it. Um, the good fortune that I had is that the DOES um, um, administrative judges are very smart. And they clearly saw right through it because she already had ruled that uh, that that wasn't admissible. But the fact that Mr. Mr. Ross and ORM are 
have documents that they are altering is a problem for me, to be honest. Also, um, in 2009, I took the agency to court after they suspended my benefits again. And under the guise that they had not paid me the right amount of money. At the hearing, they said they would um, recalculate the benefits and that they would pay me the right amount. Apparently that never happened. And when I finally got a copy because they prevent um, claimants from getting their records from ORM. Apparently when I actually got my records, it showed that they knew from since 2013 that they hadn't paid me enough. And now they're saying I only had three years to go backwards. Finally, uh, they issued some subpoenas to my regular doctors. I know I'm over. They issued some subpoenas to my regular doctors. But as you can see, I have no clue who signed them. And the law requires a name. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Sorry, I went over. Not a problem. Thank you so much. Uh, Samantha Machette. Welcome. I think as soon as you unmute, you'll be ready to go. Can you hear me now? I can. Welcome. Thank you so much. I apologize. I'm not good with these things. But my name is Samantha Machete, sir. Thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to um, testify, um, Councilman White. My name is Samantha Machete, and I work for the Department of Transportation and DDOT as a safety technician. I love my job. I love my children. But I got hurt on the job. And ever since I got hurt on the job, ORM has been totally just disrespecting me. When it first started, they, they wouldn't pay me. They said I didn't go to the right doctors. Then when I went to their doctors, the doctors that they sent me to was holding off on giving information because they weren't paying them on time. Then after I had the surgery for the first doctor, I went to the next doctor they sent me to, I had to have another surgery. Then I saw a wound care specialist. Now I'm in pain specialist. Now they got me going to um, work hardening. I can go to work hardening for two days, sir, and after that, my foot will swell up. They decided, ORM decided to stop my pay in December. I haven't got paid since December. In December, sir, I lost my sister, one week and my nephew the next week. Fortunately, by the grace of God, in order to bury them, I got help from one of the ward council members and they helped me get the money to bury them. Then my uh, finance started to bother me. I didn't know if I had COVID, so I went to the emergency um, urgent care and urgent care put me on a five day. But when I went there and I sent them my paperwork, to work hard and I took them and I gave them all of my paperwork. They, they harassed me. How many doctor's appointments do you have? Did you, just, you just got back from your sister's funeral. It was one thing after another. I have never in my life been so embarrassed to work for a company because the District of Columbia don't supposed to treat people the way they treat them. They don't supposed to treat people the way that they've been. I've been hearing the people testify. Something has to change because our next generation that's coming up, they shouldn't have to go through this. I work 
hard every day at Wilson High School to make sure that pedestrians and children get across the street safely. It's close to 3,000 children that was coming past me. I didn't ask myself to get hurt on a job, but I did expect the ORM supposed to treat me accordingly. I The first time they started, when I first filed my complaint, they didn't pay me. And I risked almost being evicted. Now they backing my money up again, sir. And that was from December. And I still got to pay my rent. I got to pay my rent. I got to pay my, my uh, apartment rent. I got to pay my, my uh, insurance for me and my son, my health insurance, life insurance. Those are things that you got to have. And with COVID going on right now, if anything happens, what you supposed to do? The city doesn't give you nothing but $200. So I would like for you all to really consider getting some type of panel together and using some of the citizens so they can get their point across because all you know is what we tell you. You've never been or on um, workman's comp before. You're only hearing what people say. Unless you go through it yourself, you really don't know. That's just my opinion. And I thank you for giving me time to testify. I thank you very much for your testimony. Oh, one more thing. Can I ask you something, sir? Um, well, let, let's wait till we get to the questions. Okay. I got, a, got another public witness. Okay. All right. Um, All right. Our next, next public witness is... Um, is uh, Aisha Clay. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well, welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I am actually um, advocating for my husband, which is Usurian Colbert, who works for DPW, um, who had got hurt on the work truck on Christmas of 2000. Um, with this accident, he had a brain injury. Um, later, we found the truck driver was under the influence of alcohol. Um, with that being said, he had broke many laws while driving, speeding, went over a speed bump and the wrong way, going the wrong way on the wrong side of the street. Um, my husband fell off. Um, I had to deal with basically um, with risk management, um, delays of medical treatment, um, where I take him to the doctor since everything has to be pre-authorized. He has been sent back home because there he cannot get his medical attention, um, transportation delays. Um, also mentioned that they did cover this up um, with MPD um, to not report in the files that he did, the driver was intoxicated. Um, with that being said, we're dealing with financial burden. Um, he is being paid two two thirds of his workman comp, but that's his set salary of fourteen hundred, which will over time he earned to three eight hundred uh, bi weekly. So it's a strain on the income in our household. Um, also, we have three minor children. Um, we're affected financially. Um, Ms. Clay, we lost you. Can you uh, can you hear me? Ms. I'm sorry, I got disconnected. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, I do apologize. Um, let me say, um, we're with um, third parties, miscommunication. Um, Miss Clay, 
Miss Clay, I, I, I want to hear your testimony. You, you're breaking up actually so much that I, we can't make out anything, but, I, but it is an important testimony. Um, let, let's try. Can you can you try uh, speaking again to see if it's uh, clearer? Better now? Yeah, it seems to be. Okay, if you would just uh, back up a, a few sentences. Okay, um, I was saying with um, risk management, we are dealing with delayed of medical treatment delayed of transportation. Um, there is a miscommunication pre-authorization with his doctor's appointments. Um, just we're dealing with a lot with financial issues. Um, with that being said, my husband have been working with DPW for over 19 years. Um, and right now we're having financial burning. Um, they basically just pays him two thirds of Miss Clay, we lost you, but I think you're back. Yes. So, um, with that being said, I'm just going to close the remarks of, you know, me and my husband has been living in D.C. our whole life, and we are pay, paying tax-paying citizens, um, which is the reason why Black people move out of the community in the first place, because we're a treat very unfair. Um, and I'm asking you and um, the committee if they can investigate um, deeper into the cover-up and the things that's dealing with my husband um, in his case and his injury. I, I appreciate it. While, while we have you, I, I want to make sure I ask questions before we, in case we lose you. Uh, for, first of all, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear about your, your husband's injury, uh, particularly <laughs> after 19 years of service to, to the city. Uh, <clears throat> I'm assuming, is he, is he fully disabled? Yes, he's fully disabled. He will be disabled for the rest of his life. And he, he, he only receives two thirds of uh, his income from workers comp. Uh, why is that? Is that because of the maximum amount we, uh, we, we pay for, um, uh, for workers comp? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and the, you mentioned delay of medical treatment. What, where's the delay coming from? Um, the delay is basically when he have his um, appointments, everything has to be pre-authorized through um, risk management. So when he gets to the, his appointments, he have been turned away um, because everything needs to be pre-authorized. Um, they do, do not follow the doctor's orders. He have in writing doctors um, to say he consistently have his PT um, speech and therefore they go on their own judgment mm -hmm. um, to make their own decisions of what he needs. Like right now, as we speak, he has been out of PT speech and OT for over three months. Um, the doctor ordered that it has to be a consistent um, consistency of his mm -hmm. treatment. Um, with management have came out and obsessed our home and ignored doctor's orders of him. Um, there's things that they have to look at the steps going up, the steps, the living conditions and all of that. Um, just to keep it within a budget cost of, you know, um, equipment, they do not order. They order what they want. Um, he needs certain equipment to come home. Um, medication, I've been turned away um, and delayed. He have a seizure medicine that he needs um, because everything needs to be pre-authorized. He's been without medicine for over two, three weeks. Um, <laughs> so our life has traumatically changed yeah. since this accident. Okay. Um Miss uh, Muschetti, first of all, I, I, I want to uh, give my condolences on the loss of, of your sister. I'm, I'm very sorry to hear about that loss. Um, and, and I'm not going to get too deeply into individual claims in, in the hearing, but, but we will follow up because I want to get to the bottom of, of what's going on. And, and I do want to note a, you know, a real concern that 
Um, you know, if we have uh, a, a system uh, whose uh, goal it is to uh, reduce costs to the district, then you know that 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 is a, seems to be a recipe for uh, exactly what we're hearing. Um, but uh, Miss Miss Muschetti, if you are still with us, um, are are you are you currently able to to work? I, I missed that part of your testimony and, and um, sort of where where things are on your your claim. Are you right now? Can you hear me, sir? Yes. Okay. Right now, uh, I just left my pain not the pain specialist, the surgeon, and the surgeon told me to go back and try to work with, work hard and, and strengthening my uh, leg, but the pain, my ankle, but the pain specialist wants me to take a, uh, it's a, it's a box that they put in your back and it, it shoots it to the nerves. Mm -hmm. So to answer to your question right now, I suppose to go back to work hard and Monday, I'm, I'm sitting in the house now with my leg propped up because of my ankle swollen. Okay. And, and as I stated before, um, sir, they have not paid me since December. Wow. And they feel when I, when I spoke to the gentleman at workman's comp, I mean, not, not workman's comp at, uh, uh, work hardening. I explained to him when he said to me, well, you've been out for your sister. I said, yeah, my sister and my nephew, because they died right behind each other. He said, well, he said, well um, if you're not here, we can't help you. And how many doctor's appointments do you have? Yeah. I'm not doing this on purpose. Yeah, no, it sounds uh, dehumanizing. And I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry for the loss of your, your nephew as well. I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, concerned about what I'm hearing from, from your testimony and, and from others. Um, and so you know, we're, we're going to reach out both to see how we can help here, but also uh, to make sure we're understanding the, the underlying uh, issues. And, and I want to ask um, uh, John Gibson, uh, with respect to sort of how we treat public employees, you know, uh, running a system with a mission of, of reducing costs, uh, having to have, you know, appointed doctors or, or pre-approved appointments, uh, inability to get total disability, uh, several other issues that you and others have mentioned. Is DC really this much of an outlier? Or, I mean, how, how it, it, um, somebody testified earlier that DC is worse than all jurisdictions. I, I, I have no idea if that's true or not. Is, is DC really that much of an outlier? Yes, sir. And in fact, the surrounding states, Maryland and Virginia, have both public and private sector, and they treat them equally in those states, unlike DC. And some of the testimony you hear heard from uh, Sister Machette and, and Clay there about ORM sending them through uh, physical therapy instead of what the doctor in one of our cases, we had a uh, DC public school employee sent to the hospital, Sibley Hospital, uh, with a broken ankle. She was told to go through physical therapy first instead of what the doctor there recommended was surgery on her ankle. Well, lo and behold, her ankle heals and it heals improperly. She can never go back to work now because it healed improperly and uh, she failed the uh, fitness for duty test. So uh, I guess that ORM thought they were the doctor, the judge and the uh, jury in that case. And uh, so that employee no longer works and is unable to work since then. I appreciate that. And, you know, so, certainly uh, Shanice Haynes, your, your testimony is consistent with, with others. Uh, you know, if you have, you can't control if your, your daughter gets COVID, certainly if you have COVID symptoms, you know, any system that sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, knocks you for that, you know, something's, something's going on here and we've got to get to the bottom of it. Um, yes, that, thank you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just, just too much consistency in these <clears throat> testimonies. Um, we, I want to ask for a, um, a question about uh, language and access. Uh, to uh, uh, Yannick uh, Amicton. Uh, what, what jurisdictions have the best language access laws or, or tools? Thanks for that question, Council Member. Um, I, I, I don't 
I don't have a, a list off of the top of my head, but I will honestly say that DC has one of the best language access tools in our toolbox. Um, the way in which we use it is a different story. But um, as far as our laws go, um, the fact that you know we we do have on the books a requirement for interpretation at major uh, you know uh, public facing agencies, covered entities, um, the fact that we do have uh, uh, you know, documents that have to be translated into different languages. These are, these are very, um, th they were at the time when they were passed in 2004, very uh, proactive and, and very new. Uh, and we were one of the leading sort of jurisdictions in this. I, I will also shout out San Francisco as having good, uh, a, a very good sort of set of language access laws that I've, I've uh, taken a look at. Um, but in all honesty, the, the problem is less with the kinds of protections we have on the books and more with the the kind of enforcement that we have yeah. um, that we or that we lack. So one, my, me, I guess my thought about enforcement is if the agencies don't get the funding in their budgets to do language access, then I, I don't know sort of where we get with enforcement. W what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely, absolutely, um, and and that's why sort of at the end of my testimony, I noted, you know, one of the best ways to make sure that OHR has the capacity to do. Uh, the sort of individual case by case enforcement um, is for language access to be a priority across agencies. Certainly, OHR's language access capacity has to be fully funded, but we have to also make sure that language access needs across agencies are funded. Um, those those two are inseparable. Um, I want to um, I want to thank our, our witnesses uh, for for your testimonies. Uh, very 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 helpful. Uh, as we examine the, the work and progress and sort of need for more progress of, of our agency. So I wanna pre uh, thank you all for taking time out to, to be with us today. Um, we are, um, we're gonna move now to uh, our government witnesses, starting with uh, Director Ross. Uh, as uh, Director Ross gets queued up, we will take a, a five minute a recess. Um, and uh, when we come back, hopefully Director Ross will be up and ready to, to testify. Uh, so the time is now 2.17 and we are in a brief five minute recess.
Uh, we are resumed. Uh, Director Ross, welcome. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, as you know, it is the uh, 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 practice of this committee to put our government witnesses under oath. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to provide to the committee on government operations and facilities is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Wonderful. Thank you very much. You uh, can begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman White, members and staff of the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities. I'm Jed Ross, Chief Risk Officer and Director of the District of Columbia's Office of Risk Management. I'm pleased to testify before you today, not only as the Director of ORM, but also as a longtime district resident and advocate of district government who believes wholeheartedly in the mayor's initiatives and vision to advance DC values and priorities. Mayor Bowser's fiscal year 2021 budget made investments that supported our efforts to deliver on the promise of our shared DC values, all while responding and supporting our community during the COVID-19 pandemic. These efforts included creating economic opportunity, making our neighborhoods safer, and providing more effective and efficient government services. ORM supports these efforts as we work each day to fulfill our commitment to provide every district resident a fair shot and a pathway to the middle class. To that end, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to highlight ORM's successes in fiscal year 2021 and share the progress made to date in fiscal year 2022. ORM's mission is to reduce the probability, occurrence, and cost of risk to the District of Columbia government. To fulfill this mission, ORM works to institutionalize and systematize the practice of risk management within district government agencies and to reduce the likelihood and severity of potential losses through the implementation of effective risk prevention and control strategies. We achieve these objectives by providing risk management leadership, guidance, and support to district agencies through ORM's four main divisions, the Public Sector Workers' Compensation Program, the TORT Division, the Risk Prevention and Safety Division, and the Captive Insurance Agency. Together, ORM's divisions work to foster a culture of risk awareness and promote risk management across our government. During fiscal year 21, one of the areas the Public Sector Workers' Compensation Program focused on was creating an agency workers' compensation summary report uh, and better workers' compensation training materials. The agency's workers' compensation summary report highlights important claim data and provides a broader audience beyond just an agency's workers' compensation coordinator. An awareness of successes and needs for improvements in workers' compensation matters for the subject agency. The report is particularly useful for annual workers' compensation reviews with agency leadership at all agencies with active workers' compensation claims. To support these efforts, Newly created training materials have been di disseminated to managers, human resource coordinators, and timekeepers to assist with training employees and supervisors on the workers' compensation claim process. The goal is ultimately to minimize injuries and consequently reduce the number of claims. Fiscal year 21 was also a busy year for ORM's RPS division, which tested its Drive to Zero online training program with a select audience. The goal is to roll out the training program in fiscal year 22 via DCHR's Percipio training platform to all employees who operate a motor vehicle. Passing the training will be required of anyone wishing to operate a DC government vehicle. The modules are designed to heighten awareness of common road hazards and the difficulties of city driving. They also aim to provide guidance for reducing and or eliminating automobile related fatalities and injuries in the district in alignment with the mayor's Vision Zero program. Other initiatives RPS developed in FY21 and plans to expand in FY22 include an audit tracking system and additional incident reporting tools. The audit tracking system gives ORM and partner agencies greater visibility into audit processes and procedures and allows us to assess agency performance related to audits. Finally, RPS has expanded the types of incident reporting and the number of participating agencies. In fiscal year 22, ORM will be able to see more district-wide incidents and analyze them to better assist with understanding and mitigating associated risks. One of the TORT Division's initiatives addresses the contingent liability, settlement, and judgment platform 
which provides real-time awareness into various legal issues pending against the district. In FY22, the platform will standardize the process and promote continuity management and payment of contingent liability claims. Another initiative involves the tort division's increased subrogation efforts. The tort division is working with agency partners to improve communication and processes that aim at recuperating lost DC taxpayer dollars. I'm proud to say that we have already collected approximately 6.4 million during the past five and a half years. And I'm looking forward to increasing those collections with the help of our sister agencies. The captive insurance agency has been diligently working to better assess the district government's risks and transfer them to third parties when possible. In addition, it has spent a significant amount of time managing some recent high value claims with the district's real property insurance carrier. The agency is working to develop processes for district agencies to work with ORM to better manage claims associated with the district's insurance policies. In fiscal year 21, the captive continued to be an excellent vehicle for local community health clinics to obtain subsidized medical malpractice insurance and, when needed, for district agencies to obtain insurance. Finally, the captive continues to work with DC government agencies to standardize insurance requirements where feasible. These requirements often need revision due to changes in the insurance marketplace and related exposures. However, where implemented appropriately, they provide consistency, transparency for both district agencies and third party partners. Looking forward to fiscal year 22, ORM has five top priorities. First, tracking litigation at district agencies. Second, subrogation. Three, customer service. Four, training. And five, expansion of our enterprise risk management program. For tracking litigation in district agencies, ORM is working to gather information on ongoing litigation to ensure visibility into the cause of district losses. Ultimately, this tool will provide insight into operational challenges and exposures in district agencies. The second objective, segregation, ORM continues to expand its efforts. In FY22, the agency will work with the Department of General Services to expand its process. The third objective around customer service um, is, is being expanded to include existing customer service surveys, but also ORM rolled out a provider questionnaire at the beginning of the fiscal year. The questionnaire is used with injured workers to ascertain their experience with providers at their recent medical appointments. The information is then used to address concerns and hopefully improve provider services. The fourth obsec objective around risk management training and workers' compensation trading, ORM's divisions plan on holding numerous trainings for both internal DC government and external partners. As I mentioned earlier, ORM delivered new workers' compensation training materials for all agency partners, and we will now hit the road to reinforce the materials with focused training and engagement. The fifth and final objective for fiscal year 22 encompasses the expansion of our ERM program. As I'm sure you know, ERM assists ORM to identify and prepare for risks associated with, for example, the district's finances, operations, and objectives. Therefore, ORM has decided to dedicate staff to the ERM program to assist with developing our ERM modules. One of these modules assists with tracking and scoring district agencies' ERM concerns, and we anticipate rolling out a simplified version in fiscal year 22. Chairman White. I wanna be sure I highlight the wonderful work of my staff. They've done a fantastic job during the pandemic in very uncertain times. All district government employees should be given accolades and support for their often unsung efforts during the last year and beyond. I and my entire agency appreciate you allowing us the time to highlight the great work ORM has done and will do in future years. ORM will continue to partner with other district government agencies, interested members of the public, and the council to reduce and mitigate risk across the district. Thank you for your leadership and support in these efforts. As always, ORM will ensure the channels of communication with you and your staff remain open and productive, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, so starting with the, the public witness testimony, uh, we heard from witnesses that ORM is not uh, respecting court precedent by shifting the burden to injured workers 
in cases where the office is trying to terminate benefits. Uh, do you have a, a response to, to that testimony? Um, sure, council member. So the office risk management follows all of our regulatory and our legal um, obligations. So under the legislation um, and under our regulations, we follow the exact processes of what we're supposed to do. Um, we at the Office of Risk Management ensure that we are reliant upon medical evidence. Everything that we do is based on medical evidence. You know, the Office of Risk Management cannot make a determination or, on its own without a physician stating that this, these are the facts, establishing what a permanency rating should be or an injury rating should be or, or whether or not something is medically appropriate. Um, all of those decisions are provided based on medical evidence um, and based on facts. So um, when you say based on medical evidence, to whose determination? So the medical providers, the multiple medical providers that any injured worker would uh, has for their care, they're making the determination as to whether or not somebody's entitled to benefits or not. So if a termination were to ever occur, saying somebody is is healthy enough to return back to work, it's based on a physician stating as such it's not there's no there's not office of risk management independent authority for us to make a, a determination to terminate somebody's benefits it's based on a physician's guidance and and decision and a, and then those who, who, who acts, selects the physician so um at initial treatment uh, injured workers always are able to select their physicians um, we, of course, when injured workers file claims, we say here, here are a list of different physicians that you can go to. Um, when we don't get information or their physicians fail to fill out the, the details that we need, we then would work with the injured worker to make sure they're going to a physician who's going to be responsive. Right? Well, we have our, our, regula our regulations that require the physician, you know, you can't provide a doctor's note that just says this person will be out for six weeks. Right. They need to provide a doctor's note that says this individual has restrictions on their work or they need to be out for this particular thing. And the duration will be at this point and they need to have these other processes in order to follow. It just needs to be an exhaustive based on us being able to administer our regulations and our law um, in the district. But so let me let me let me clarify something that I, I did. Quite well. You said that the injured worker can select their physician, but then you said you send them a list of physicians. So you're saying they can select from the list or they can select their own physician, period. So at initial treatment, they can, if, you know, it's an emergency, somebody, they go to whatever physician, whatever hospital, whatever process they need to do. Okay. If somebody files a claim with our office, our office will say, here's a list of all the places we'll, we'll look up geographically to see people that are close by, give them a number of names. They then get to pick who they want to go to. Um, uh, so it's, there's no de de definitive direction saying you must only go to this doctor. It's not like we're choosing one individual doctor who then's ruling on behalf how, of- How do doctors get onto that list? They, they, can, they, we actually create, we have a provider relations team who mm -hmm. actually can allow for any physician to, who's board certified, who, you know, who, who, who is, is a physician treating in, in the specialty or in, as a general primary care physician. All they need to do is talk with us, or if the, if the injured worker were to say, I want to go see this physician, we can go talk to that that, that particular physician, make sure that they um, basically get on a provider agreement, they know what they have to do, filling out our forms and follow the process, and they can see that physician. There's no, the, ulterior, the there's no, there's no like mass ulterior motive in order to try and keep people from seeing particular physicians. What we do need, though, is a physician who's going to be responsive to meet our, our regulations and our laws. I will say there are times when we will request information from a physician and they won't be responsive to us. They won't even give us the data that we need. And then who suffers is the injured worker because we are unable to then respond to their claim effectively because we're not getting information. So what we who pays the physicians on, on your list when they have to do an examination, make a determination? Who who pays them? We pay for them. We okay. pay for all the medical care associated with work, any work-related injury. If it's not a work-related injury, then you know, oftentimes we'll have individuals who have work-related injury, but say they they, they had some other you know bodily injury or some other type of illness or disease that matter isn't paid for by us. And obviously, then we have to make sure we're paying for the particular 
uh, work-related injury and paying the lost wages particular to that. So n- naturally, some somebody who is suspicious would say, well, you know, doctors sort of have an incentive to, to be on that list. And so they are incentivized to, uh, you know, sort of, you know, n- not approve sort of, you know, major, major claims. How, how would you respond to that? We have, I mean, we're, we have, I think, you know, hundreds and hundreds of different physicians. We have, we're, we're open to any and all physicians. I mean, there is no limit. Moreover, they have no incentive. The only incentive that they have actually is to get reimbursed, right? To make sure that they're going to get paid by the district. Not that there's, there's no incentive for them to follow a particular process. We are not directing medical care in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we might... Uh, we want we want them to get the best care. It's in our interest. It's in the district's interest, and it's in the injured worker's best interest for everyone to get healthy and return back to work. Right? That is our goal. That is what we want. That is what we do. That is the purpose of the legislation. That is a distinction from the private sector. Um, you know, our goal is to get all of our DC government employees healthy and working and safe. Um, which is why it actually makes sense for all of these functions to be in the same place. Okay. Are, are there any doctors who have like a significant amount of their, their work or practices uh, with ORM or, or uh, public employees? To my knowledge, there's not like one doctor who that's all they do. No, definitely not. There are, there's different multiple practices that deal with us regularly. There are different, but we, you know, we work with every every hospital system, every physician, you know, we we're willing to work with any physician. They have the capability um, and uh, the specialties or the capabilities to treat our injured workers. We want them. Actually, it's our goal as a part of provider relations to continue to expand, to continue to get more physicians engaged, more physical therapy uh, practitioners, you know, anywhere we can provide support and services to our injured workers, that's what we want. There is no, we don't ask them to do anything particular. They don't have to, you know, they have to follow our process by filling out our forms and getting us the medical evidence um, so we can make decisions to then pay our injured workers lost wages and everything else. Uh, but other than that, there there's no goal to be removing people. There's no goal to like only pick particular ones. We have a, an exhaustive uh, p- panel of providers and want more. So, um, and there's no incentive for us to have one or one group who do one thing. That's not the case at all. Well, what, what's the reason to not just let folks use whatever physician they want? I mean, if they if they if they fill out the appropriate forms. I mean, if they don't, the consequences would fall on the the claimant or the employee, right? So why not just let them? You know, select their own. And often they're <laughs> them a list of anyone to pick from. So, I mean, we give them a lot of people to, to choose from. We look at their geographic area. If they tell us there's some issue or concern or they need a specialty, then we work with that particular specialty and we move it. We're happy to adjust. What I will say is in the event that they have their particular treating physician, so long as that treating physician is doing everything and, and is able to fill out all the documents that we need in order to make the decisions, to adjudicate their matters, we're happy to do so. I'll say there are matters. We we have like a 98% success rate in being responsive to injured workers within 30 days of the all their claim files being claim forms being filed. When I started, it was 70% were not successful, right? That we had to continue to kick the can down the road because we didn't have the medical information. So we are now being able to do all of, we're able to get back to the injured workers and and ensure they're getting paid fast and doing the things to get them proper medical care fast. Unfortunately, if they go to just a regular physician who doesn't understand the process, who won't be responsive to us, then we're unable to adjudicate the matter. But but I mean, but couldn't that be the the option of the, the employee that, I mean, they may have to say, if sign something that says, look, if you're, you know, you can pick your position, but if they don't, you know, submit the necessary forms, that's going to fall on, fall on you. And, and oftentimes that happens, council member. I mean, we have, we, we, we have situations where we're waiting months and months and months, and then we'll push saying like, look, you really need to see somebody who's going to be responsive. Here's a list of people for you to choose from. But we do have circumstances. We do have plenty of circumstances where people are seeing their treating physicians. So we're not, um, it's I, not I guess I'm, I'm, I'm confused about who, what the list is. People are not confined to this list of physicians or they are. Sorry, can you? Uh, the, the, you you have a list of physicians, correct? We what, have what, we have people. We have panel providers. Yes, 
Mm-hmm. Okay. And what determinations do, do they make, the, the approved providers? Or they, they, they do the treatment or they make the determination? They're managing the medical care for the injured worker, whether it's a, a surgery that's needed or physical therapy that's okay. needed or, or, so prescri- I have a, or prescriptions. You know, okay. So I have a, a um, my, my um, uh, primary care physician let's assume my primary care physician is not on that list. Sure. I get injured. That's who I want to be in charge of my treatment. What happens? So generally what we would say is, okay, if they want to participate in the program, you know, we first, we get their initial information, we get the response. We'll start working on that. And we'll say, we, we want, there's, this is a panel, you know, you have an orthopedic problem, right? Oftentimes what happens is people will go to their primary care physician, but they have a particular issue. Say it's a, a shoulder issue, but that G, that GP doesn't necessarily have the experience to deal with an orthopedic concern or a specialty that makes sense. And so what happens is we'll say here, you need to, you need to go to a specialist. specialist. Here's the list of the doctors who specifically treat and manage these particular issues, you know, whether it's an ankle or, you know, whatever the particular concern is. So we will actually say, here, the people to go to. Now, if, they're, if their general practitioner is an orthopedist specialist, they either should be on our panel, or they, they either are on our panel, or they should be on our panel. And if they're not, then we're happy to have them join the panel and say, okay, here are all the forms you need to fill out. But what will happen is it'll be just a general practitioner who doesn't necessarily deal with that particular injury, you know, a work-related injury. They deal with people being out sick or they've got a cold or they have strep or, you know, whatever their concerns might be, but they're not a, a, a wrist surgeon or, or, or an elbow specialist. And so what'll happen is they'll just write a generic doctor's note and it basically negatively impacts the the program and the care to that injured worker. So we have this exhaustive program built to specially provide care to people who are being injured on the job. In the event that they're, they're, your general practitioner has that particular experience, they are hopefully already on our panel. And if they're not, we want to add them to our panel so other people could then choose them as their general practitioner, general treating physician. That makes sense. Um, how, what's the process for getting for, for being added to the, the panel? So they come to our provider relations team. We actually have to work. Uh, we we basically say, okay, here's all the forms that you'll have to fill out whenever you have to do um, matters for uh, uh, getting reimbursement from the office of risk management. Um, much like anybody who signs up as a Medicare doctor or Medicaid doctor, right? They have to fill out the forms, understand their process. And then we have to go to the office of tax and revenue to ensure that they get into our source system so we can make payments to them to make sure that they don't owe taxes or other things of that sort. Um, And then we basically, we get a W-9 from them. We go through uh, the OCFO, we get them in the system and then that's it. We, they submit their invoices and we make sure they get processed. Okay. Um, now, what about initial assessments? Who, who makes the initial assessment uh, on an, an, an injury, work-related injury? One other thing I failed to mention, uh, council members, that the statute requires us to create a managed care organization, which is this panel. You know, th- it, this is established that we're we're obligated to create this panel, to create this group, in order to provide the best care for our injured workers. Um, so just wanted to make sure I mentioned that. And, and um, as it relates to your, your question, typically if it's an emergency, individuals are going, you know, they're calling the ambulance, they're going to the ER, they're going to an outpatient center, um, or they're going to their general practitioner. We make sure we make payments to all the individuals whenever they go to those visits. Then they file the claims and the incidents with our office. And then we have a team who walks them through that process. Uh, we have a call center. We have a, um, not only do we have the call center, but then we have individuals who help, help tell everybody what they need to do and what they need to know. We provide them with all the forms, all the information. And then we even have a nurse case management team who will then work with that particular injured worker and say, I'm looking at your file, I'm looking at your injury, I'm looking at your concerns, I'm going to talk to your providers, I'm going to talk to, to all the different people who are helping to manage your care. And I too am here for you to provide you with care. So we have nurses on staff in addition to all the processes that we take. 
what, what about when it's not an emergency, which I would imagine is the more common practice. So when it's not an emergency, um, what what's the process there? Who makes the determination of sort of the injury, the limitations that derive from that injury? And so sure. Forth? So obviously, it's always based on a physician. So they'll go and see a physician. They'll see some you know, some licensed medical provider. Anyone um, that they choose. Uh, initially, yes, for sure. Okay. Um, uh, then it's then then as soon as we get the notification of, of the claim or the incident, we start doing outreach. Generally, we do like a three or four point contact and we'll reach out to the supervisor, the injured worker and the medical provider. And we'll work with the medical provider to get all the information. We'll make sure all the forms get filled out and then all those forms come into our office. And then we make a determination to accept or deny that claim. I'll say on the vast majority of our claims, we accept them. You know, when somebody's injured on the on the job and the medical provider says this is a work related injury and here are the concerns associated with it. Here's the plan of care for the injured worker. We accept the claim. So that's the process. Okay. So, so it's all based on the medical provider saying, this is the injury. This is the treatment that's needed. This is a plan of care that's needed. And they submit that information and documentation to us. And so long as it was, it was a work-related injury, then we accept the claim. All right. So, so if I'm, if I'm injured at work, I'm, let's say I'm having trouble walking. I go to my primary care physician. They mm -hmm. say, you got to go to an orthop orthopedic doctor. My orthopedic doctor says, you know, look, you, you're not going to be walking for, for some time. <clears throat> I uh, file a workers' comp claim. What, what then happens to determine, <clears throat> uh, you know, sort of my, my compensation and uh, yeah. So we reach out to the medical providers, they fill out all the information and they, you know, all the forms of the details specific to your particular medical conditions. They, of course, assign it to your to to something that happened while while in the course of your work. And then we would accept that claim and we will pay two two thirds, 66 and two thirds of people's salaries which is tax-free, um, and that is established by statute. It's the same as the private sector. There's really no distinction about the 66 and two-thirds. Um, we pay that to everyone. There is a cap, um, but our cap is more than other, uh, is more than other places. Um, so, you know, we then establish all of the appropriate amounts to pay. We start issuing indemnity payments. We start paying for all the medical care. We do all that expeditiously. I mean, there was a there was a time before I and my team came on board and before we in-house the program where those decisions were taking months and years to get done because we couldn't get the medical information. We couldn't get the facts from the injured workers in a, in a way that enabled us to adjudicate the claims. And so now, like I said, 98% of the time, we are getting all the information within 30 days, you know, 30 days in answering the question and the issue. So um, that was something that was 70% of the time we were being non-responsive within 30 days, right? Mm -hmm. So it's been a complete turnaround for every injured worker is getting responses, care, and has a process for, for their matters to be solved. All right. So in the, in, in the hypothetical we, we just went through, and I, and I appreciate your response about what happens, N nowhere in your response did you mention me having to go to, to an approved, uh, you know, physician. Sure. So when you, so typically you, you wouldn't go directly to an orthopedist the next day, right? Uh, what, what generally is going to happen is you would, you, you might go to your general practitioner. It's, you know, you have a weakness in your leg, say it was right. Rather than, you know, I would argue if you can't walk, it's an emergency, but, but none, you know, based on one work related incident. Um, so what will happen is, you know, you would go to your general practitioner you would be filing your claim with the office risk management, hopefully right away. You know, we it's our goal that when 24 hours of an incident, that, that that claim, that incident is going to be filed with our office so we can begin to do outreach. What we don't want is DC government employees to be languishing because they don't know what to do, they don't know where to go. They don't, we don't want people to have to go search for their own orthopedist and getting references and then go through a normal process to get an appointment. 
we want them to be able to get access to fast and good medical care right away. So they, when they file their notification with our office, then we have a team who's dedicated to following up with them and talking to them and saying, here you go. Here's a bunch of people very close to your house that you can go see. You can pick whoever you want. And then they would get to those particular specialties who can then provide them with the expertise on how they recover, you know, whether it's physical therapy, occupational therapy, whatever it might be in order to get them back to work as fast as possible, which is better for everybody. You know, we don't want people to just get paid 66 and two thirds tax free. We want people to be able to get back to their jobs. We want them to be able to, to, to continue and remain in the workforce. Um, so there's never a scenario, a circumstance where, where we want people to languish. We want people to be fast and responsive and come to us so we can get them good and appropriate medical care. Um, and, and if you don't like the provider, if the provider doesn't work out, you can switch. Yes. Yeah. If an injured worker were to say, this provider is not doing a good job. I don't feel like they're hearing me or coming to me fast enough. We, by all means, they can pick a different provider and there's lots of people to choose from. You know, like I said, we are obligated to create this managed care organization. And we, we want as many physicians Private, you know, private sector affiliated with the best hospitals in the United States. We want everybody, and we don't have any dictation on what they do or how they don't do it, so long as they give us the information, so we can administer the program as we're obligated to do. Now, um, you're you're suggesting this is a benefit, but it, according to the testimony, so our our process is we're, we're an outlier here. Um, so, you know, I I can speak to that if you like, please. So the office of risk management was um, took over um, took over this function, um, and it was uh, inherited ultimately from the federal process from FICA is what it's called the Federal Employee Compensation Act, and so the district process actually is better. Um, I've testified extensively about this, but. Um, all of our injured workers get cost of living adjustments and in the private sector, they don't. So year over year, they're getting increases in their salary. Whereas in the private sector, it's fixed, it's established. They will never get more money um, biweekly uh, in the private sector. And so we are an outlier for sure in that we do some things differently. We also were built based on the federal model that helps to get people back to work. It's focused on injuries and helping them. We have, we have retention rights for employees. Employees, we, we, you can't just fire people. Whereas in the private sector, what they do is they just work out a settlement, they close out the case, they pay people for their injury, and they don't find, then it's up to them to find another job. So the Office of Risk Management, we give them vocational rehab. We do all sorts of things to help our D.C. government injured workers in order to be able to get back to D.C. government jobs or any other job. Recently, we had a case where an individual went through our process, had been out for a number of years, and just got a job with DHS um, because we went through the process of getting them healthy so they can be back in, in the workforce, which is the goal. There are some people, obviously, who have very significant injuries and won't come back to the workforce. And in those circumstances, they're getting every year, they're going to get increases whenever, whenever other district government employees get salary increases, we're ensuring that they're getting increases too, which is something that doesn't happen in the private sector. Uh, we, we also receive testimony that ORM can avoid appeals by just refusing to issue a decision on a worker's benefits. Is that accurate? That is not accurate. Um, we, we, we follow all legal processes. There's, there are many opportunities, many reviews. Um, uh, whenever, if, if we were ever got a ruling that was against us and we didn't want to, we, we felt it was wrong, we can appeal, but we still have to proceed to court and request a stay to not honor that award. And, and just recently we made a payment um, uh, after a stay was not award, was a stay was not awarded. Moreover, then in another similar case, we issued a payment based on the exact same fact, saying we're not going to even request a stay. So we make payments when 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 judges make determinations. So it, it's it's patently false to say that we are um, that we just ignore court orders. I mean that is, I will tell you, the Office of Risk Management before me joining, they had one lawyer for the entire office 
they were not able to adjudicate matters effectively. They did not respond efficiently. There was a system uh, 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 failure under the prior administrations that they could not respond. They could. They didn't have good regulatory process. They had no effective way to get back to injured workers and their attorneys. But now we have a, an effective process. We are responsive. We follow the rules. We actually get back to people. Matters are being litigated all the time. Many of you know you heard from a number of uh, attorneys. Let me let me pause for a second because we we went down a very different road than where I was trying to go. Sorry. So the the testimony, the concern was that ORM can avoid appeals by refusing to issue a a decision. And in, into so that is not true. I okay. Mean, we, we establish rules to, to to establish rules that we have to be responsive within certain de- time frames okay. and be responsive. If we don't have medical evidence, mm-hmm. then of course we're unable to we're unable to make a decision. So ultimately, we might make a decision and deny something, saying we have no medical evidence. But all that is incumbent upon the medical provider that they're often choosing uh, to be responsive, right? So the the only time when we don't respond within a timely f- fashion should be based on the fact that we don't have medical information mm-hmm. from the providers related to the particular work-related injury. Um, so and you let the claimant know that, you know, you don't have the required information. Definitely. I mean, that should be our goal. What, what I will say is my team, they are amazing. They work hard. They are, you know, they're constantly, you know, we're managing payments of thousands and thousands of dollars to people. People are not always happy if things don't happen as efficiently, but I, and they can take that out on my staff, which, you know, as I said, unsung heroes. But I will also say that they are doing an excellent job. We have improved vastly, but that does not mean that we are 100% perfect every time. We, in the last fiscal year, we had over 600 claims filed. Um, so we had over 600 claims filed. It's clear we're not having, and that was that's last year. The year before, there was 600. You know, we are administering. But what's your goal for uh, for issuing a the timeline for issuing a, a decision in a, a worker? The initial decision, based on all the forms being filed with our office, is 30 days. And as okay. I said, it's around 90. Like we're, okay, yeah, 98 percent. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, we also received a concern in the uh, testimony. This was from I, I think Robert Taylor. Uh, that that we've carved OAH out of most administrative appeals of decisions by ORM is 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 that accurate? That's not accurate. There are a number of matters. There are certain types of matters that go to the Office of Administrative Appeals, mm-hmm. and then there are certain types of matters that come to the Office of Risk Management. What what it what we've done is, and what makes a ton of sense to me, uh, is that we actually establish a process, an internal appeals process, like any any agency should have, right? To make sure that there is an approval, that, that things are being done properly. From a judicial economy perspective, it does not make sense for us to have somebody make a decision and then never even double check to make sure that it was done properly. So whenever an injured worker has a, a, a concern about something not having been done right, in, in these particular areas, they file an appeal with our office. And then what happens is it goes through a review. The reason why this works is that around 30% of the time, at least, we have remanded cases for the program to fix their mistakes. So we have an internal process to to fix the problems so we don't have to go and wait for uh, a six-month hearing from the Office of Administrative Hearings to then say, okay, well, I want to change here or this should be changed. We have a 30-day time period and terms of responding to the appeal, 30 or 60 days, I believe, depending on the type of circumstance. And then we review it and we say we were correct, or we say, no, this department, you know, the public sector workers' compensation program needs to adjust to it. Mm-hmm. And then it gets adjusted. And there's, so there's a, there's a, a process. And these are, these are form one appeals, right? Which I know you're familiar with. And anytime those appeals are then, uh, um, questioned 
or uh, want to be appealed further, there's additional legal process to appeal it where they can go to the courts and they can get their decisions uh, in the event that they feel that it was done incorrectly. So, um, you know, there's no, there's no, there's no um, system where it's self-serving or somehow harmful. If anything, we've created a process which is much more efficient. We, we're more responsive, we're faster and responsive. We uh, resolve the issue quicker and we enable the individual then to follow appropriate legal methods. No decision by any agency in different district government is end, ends with that district government agency. There is always an ability to go to the courts to appeal those matters. So when, when you appeal, um, th there was testimony that uh, that there's a distinction between private sector process and yours, that <clears throat> when, uh, w when, when an employee receives a favorable determination in the private sector, they get the payment while the appeal is pending, but not in, in DC. Is, is that accurate? And if so, is, is that right? So it just depends. I mean, they're very fact specific. What I'll say on based on inter initial determinations, whether we're going to accept the claim generally or not accept the claim. In those particular circumstances, there are, you know, if we're not accepting the claim, we're not making any payments. But if we've accepted a claim and then we're working towards a termination or whatever it might be, based on a doctor's medical evidence, nothing that, you know, not independent, everything based on medical evidence, you know, there will be different facts and different scenarios that are very specific based on, on, on whether or not we're making payments. But I will tell you, every time we are obligated to make a payment, we make a payment. I mean, we paid out, we paid out, I think, $12 million in lost wages last year. So it's, so there's no scenario where, where we're using appeals or court process in order to not make payments. When we're obligated to make a payment, we make a payment. Um, and, and if anything, we I want to make payments. When people are entitled to payments, when people have been hurt or their family members have been hurt, we want to make payments. Well, you know, this is a this is a law that we should be doing the right thing for people. You know, it doesn't matter if they were contributorily negligent, right? We have a lot of circumstances where people will put a wire up in their office, or, you know, a, a, an extension cord, and then they trip over it and they hurt themselves. We don't get to litigate about how much is their responsibility. We simply pay them. 66 and two thirds and we pay for their medical care because it was done while they were working and it was in the course of their work. Um, so we follow the rules, we follow the law. Some individuals don't always like that. Um, and sometimes they don't like when a doctor says that they're healthy to return to work. And then those matters get litigated. And that's a normal thing. That's normal for anyone, you know, for any benefit the district taxpayers provide to anybody in the entire all district residents, you know, you want access to um, special housing vouchers, or you want access to um, special SNAP benefits. You, there's a process that people go through, and then there's times when people are no longer eligible, and we go through the the, the process to be um, both supportive of people, but also to follow the rules that are established by law. Uh, what about? you know, the testimony that someone testified that she wasn't able to make an appointment because of a family COVID issue and, and that she was penalized for having to reschedule an appointment. What, why would something like that happen? I think that, um, you know, without going into specifics about each and every case, what I will say is, you know, I'm happy to do that with you, council member in the committee um, in a private setting, uh, you know, to not, of course, talk about people's public medical or, or, or public private matters, I should say. Um, but I will just say in general, my team will work with anyone for any particular circumstance when it's valid and warranted by all means. I mean, there, there, we, there are exceptions when it's, it's warranted or it's for the best health and safety of that particular individual or for their family. I can't tell you how many times we work it through. Does that mean that it will always work instantaneously at the front end through the right exact process? Not always, because those are typically outliers, right? There's special, specialized circumstances that have to be evaluated. So, but I will just say, those are, we always work with individuals whenever they have concerns. Initially, you might say, okay, you need to do this. I, you know, so I, with that, I will say, I'll be happy to talk about individual cases with you and your, and the committee at, at any time. I'm more than happy to do so. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but um, 
uh, Mr. Uh, John Gibbs and it raised concern that the public benefits are, are run with a mission of reducing costs. Is, is that the mission of the agency? That is not the mission of the agency related to providing medical care. Um, I mean, that is, that is not our, our goal. What, what our goal is, is to go and look to see that employees are working in a safe environment, that they're trained, that they know what to do, that we're preventing risks. So yes, we want to reduce costs, but never ever have I or any of my staff been in a situation where we say, we're going to, if something is medically necessary, mm -hmm. and we are told to do something based on medical evidence that, that everyone agrees with, there'll never be a scenario where we're going to say, no, you can't have that, or no, that's not the right thing. If it's deemed that it's not medically necessary, or somebody's looking for um, something that is not medically appropriate, of course, there have to be checks and balances to protect the taxpayers. But I will tell you, with, with, without, uh, without a second's hesitation, we are providing everything that we possibly can. And there will never be a scenario where anyone on my staff that I would approve or be okay with to try and reduce costs at the cost of helping an individual. I mean, that's, that's amoral in my opinion. I will also say I reached out to Mr. Gibson, left him a voicemail message late last week. Um, but I've never gotten an email from, from, you know, that the particular union about any problems or any concerns related to our program, but I'm more than happy to have a meeting and a conversation and, and discuss what it is that we do, um, and make sure that they, that, um, anyone and everyone understands how we are actively supporting our injured workers, you know, providing prompt quality medical care is, is beneficial to everybody. You know, there's no scenario where we would be harmful, actively harmful to individuals. Um, we do have processes we need people to follow because those are the laws, those are the rules. But other than that, we want people to get the best care. If they can go to the best physician, I am all for it. That is what I want. I'm not trying to reduce costs in any way, shape or form at the cost of people's medical care. I and my staff, that's, people don't take these jobs in order to do that. You know, we're government employees, not, you know, a, a, a private um, insurance carrier. Uh, let me shift gears a, a little bit. You, you mentioned uh, in your testimony that the tort division is working with agency partners to recuperate lost DC taxpayer dollars, and the effort has recovered $6.4 million so far. Um, can, can you talk to me about this in, in a bit more detail, and particularly where, uh, where are you recovering these funds? So this is generally, um, it's called subrogation for, for the members of the public that don't know. I'm sure I know you know, council member, but it's our ability to act like uh, a collections agency on behalf of district taxpayers. Um, we are not a collections agency, but we go to pursue monies when third parties have harmed the district taxpayers. So uh, you can imagine all the roadway signs. Whenever there's an accident and DDOT has to go and replace a sign, we then work with DDOT to get the information, to get the details about who damaged that sign, and we'll go to their insurance carriers to collect the money to replace that government property. Um, so we'll do that, What even if they harm a district government employee, we'll then go after the individuals who harmed a district government employee to recuperate those funds so the taxpayers aren't paying the burden for a third party's negligence. So we, um, I, you know, I'm very, very proud of my subrogation team headed up by Peter Clark. They, um, they're just beyond judicious. They work really hard. So as we get incidents reported to us, when people damage government property, we then will go and reach out, we'll ascertain what happened, and then we'll work to try and collect that money and bring it back to the taxpayers. So over the last five years, we've collected $6.4 million. When I started, I think the first year before my tenure, we collected twenty or thirty thousand dollars in taxpayer money. So, you know, we're really spending energy and effort to to go get money to help the taxpayers and re reimburse the taxpayer funds that have been lost through third party damages. Uh, who who in the agency does that? So at the Office of Risk Management, um, we have a number of team members, but Peter Clark, Nazel Espinosa, 
and, um, and Nicole Skibicki all work to, to collect that. And then when it needs to refer to litigation, then we've been working with the Office of Attorney General to make sure that they will litigate to go collect those dollars and we'll refer the actual litigation to them. But besides that, we work then with all the agency risk managers and all the people at the agencies who are doing the work to replace those equipment and the details, and they'll get us those facts. So we work with agency risk management representatives and we understand then you know, what happened We'll look for witnesses and data so then we can go pursue and demand that those parties and their insurance carriers to reimburse the taxpayers. All right. Does it, I mean, does it make sense like those? Do we do we pay more in sort of salaries and benefits for trying to get this thing done than we do uh, in, in our return on that investment? No, I think out of uh, the funds we, and it's in, in all of my responses, I think we have around $200,000 that goes towards paying for that. A lot of the functions we don't even use from the subrogation funds, but last year we collected $775,000. Uh, this year we're already over $200,000. You know, we're, the year hasn't happened. So every year we're well exceeding the amount of money that we're expending on it. But I will, not only that, but we're also, it also enforces a culture of, of um, people knowing that this is what we need to do. One of the biggest barriers and challenges is that when we don't find out about the accidents or the problems or the damaged property, Mm -hmm. we're not able to go after it. So which is why we push so hard on our e-risk system and training people to report incidents. The more we know about these problems and issues, the more we're able to then go collect on behalf of the taxpayers, but it well exceeds the amount of money that we expend on it. Um, it, It's, it's a definitely a, a, it helps the general fund of the district every year. Okay. Uh, and w- with respect to subrogation, um, your testimony noted that an FY22 ORM uh, will work with DGS to, to expand its uh, subrogation process. This was a, a priority last fiscal year as well. Can you uh, talk about the progress that, that you made in FY21 to date regarding the expansion of, of this process. Sure. Um, we've had extensive um, increased conversations as it relates to DPR and FEMS, um, along with uh DGS, I mean, uh, with DDOT and and even DPW, um, you know, the goal is all the agencies where people are getting hurt and or where our property is being damaged, we are actively working with them. The second incidents are coming in, we're reviewing them for two purposes. We're reviewing them for risk prevention and safety. You know, is this something that we need to help respond to about, uh, you know, uh, an unsafe work condition or some other type of scenario that's that's not... um, safe for employees. And then we're also looking at it to see if there was a scenario where somebody was harmed. So um, we're looking at them same day, if not, you know, next day at the latest, and then we're going after for subrogation efforts. So one of the things that we've, our enhanced efforts is about training. So we actually, the Department of Behavioral Health um, is, we've signed an MOU and they're going to be using our incident reporting system. We also are um, doing outreach with OSI and CFSA. So we, we have a lot of agencies that are continuing to, to increase their use of incident reporting, which then enables us to do more subrogation. We also are are meeting with our subrogation partners at MPD and um, FEMS and DPW and DDOT and all these other agencies on a very regular occurrence. So we're getting the information so we can go after it. Council member, you're on mute. I appreciate that. Um, I have my daughter is rolling over my head, so sometimes I put the mute on, so it's not distracting. Um, the uh, you, you mentioned uh, risk management and workers' comp trainings uh, to agencies. What have you gotten any feedback from um, agencies uh, after conducting these trainings? Um, everything has been uh, positive. Nobody has contacted me to say that they've had any problems or any concerns. Um, it's been. Uh, you know, the more we educate people about process and what they need to do, the better it is. Um, we want everyone to know about what the process is. We want it to be simple. Um, and we want to be able to give information to leadership so they can understand what's going on, what's impacting their workforce. You know, everybody is being impacted uh, during the pandemic from a, from a labor perspective. 
And so the more tools and information we can provide to agency leadership and partners about what's happening around workplace injuries, you know, it'll enable us to then provide training or additional equipment, additional things to protect employees. And so um, having that con uh, complete picture and complete, complete conversation is beneficial to everyone. And council member, you might be on mute again. Thank you. Um, last year, you you noted uh, five vacancies, and this is from question 11 in the pre-hearing uh, responses. Um, and uh, there, were, there were two in agency management, three in the public sector workers' compensation program. Um, this year, you know, eight um, vacancies, two in agency management, two in insurance, and four in the public sector workers' compensation programs, uh, obviously an increase. Uh, what, what, is, what is the agency doing to fill those vacancies and improve retention? We, um, yes, we've been working uh, feverishly. Um, we have a great HR team and DCHR has been a great partner in getting our postings out and being active to try and um, anytime anyone resigns or leaves for another job, these are not separations. So I just want to be clear it's not like a there's 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 not a bunch of separations because our team is doing such a great job in such difficult conditions but as as is happening throughout the entire country uh, people are looking for other opportunities people are going to other opportunities um, so uh, we work to backfill those positions as quickly as possible we're in a pretty good position generally i don't think we're all that bad off um, that said i know we have filled some of those positions that are were listed uh, since we submitted our responses. Uh, but I will also say that we, we have people who will take other opportunities, whether it be in district government or elsewhere. Um, and then we feverishly work to do it. I will say some of the positions are also very hard to fill, especially in our insurance area. Finding capable, um, competent experts in insurance is difficult. Um, and this is more on the business lines, property, um, you know, cyber, commercial uh, insurance, not anything related to, to tort liability or um, workers' compensation. And finding those individuals has been tough, but what we've done is we've actually done additional efforts with LinkedIn and other places and have gotten actually a lot more applicants. So that's been really fantastic. Um, and I think we're gonna be in a much better position uh, this fiscal year, and I think even um, you know, prospectively. Um, it just becomes a, a challenge in general, um, you know, with the way of the world right now with employee retention. We, I did send out an employee uh, survey around continuing to increase morale. What things can we do at the agency to improve? Um, so, so we're having those conversations um, internally. Just want to make sure that we're supporting everybody. Um, uh, the DC code requires ORM to provide a cost of risk report to the council by February 1st each year. In, in your responses to the pre-hearing questions, you noted that ORM was not able to meet the February 1st, 22 deadline due to issues with e-risk and delays uh, by OAG's new litigation management system, Abacus. Uh, other than uh, the litigation management system, what, what other external systems are causing delay in uh, ERIS being fully implemented? Um, no major, there are no other major areas where that's a concern. I think one of the challenges for us in general is, you know, establishing good baselines year over year is, is hard. Agencies are apples to apples and I mean apples to oranges in terms of you know, DCPS has a, a significant number of uh, security guards. And so that's a cost to risk versus the Office of Disability Rights doesn't have security guards. And so making sure that the system can have everything um, established. So year over year, we have the appropriate baselines is one of the challenges there. But to answer your question there, with, with, with the exception of advocates, I will also say, ultimately, the financial system, the DIFFS system at the OCFO will have a big and positive impact for us being able to make sure that we're tracking information and coordinating. So I'd say those are two areas where, where we could have additional um, you know, collaboration, but obviously first and foremost, we need to have our systems functional, meaning their systems need to be operational for their own operations. And then being able to tie them in and be able to build from that will be helpful. And is uh, e-risk managed by Octo or an independent contractor? 
Um, E-risk is managed internally with office risk management and Octo. Um, it's a third party system uh, where, we, where we contract to have access and licenses, but really all the internal management of it, um, with the exception of some developments that happen, mostly it's managed between ORM and, and then uh, with support from Octo. Uh, and when 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 will we get the uh, report, the required report? I will. Um, I'm going to work to make sure in the coming months that we will get the report out. Um, Want to ensure that it's accurate from a baseline perspective. I think one of the challenges that we've had, as I said, is that um, agencies will submit subjective data, uh, and then the problem becomes that. Year over year, we have a new employee, they'll submit information and it just doesn't match. So it becomes unhelpful to the office risk management and to the city and to the council to giving details about where and how we're spending uh, risk man dollars on risk. And so we need to ensure that it's going to be systematized. Mm -hmm. So it takes away that subjectivity and becomes object uh, objective. Um, and that's the goal that we're working on. Um, the, you all, um, conducted 80 customer service surveys for providers since the beginning of fiscal year 21, 73 of the 80, uh, customer service surveys gave providers an excellent score in customer service. How, how, how do you, um, how is the survey done? Is it, I mean, do people like it, do you actively ask people to complete the survey? You know, how, how do you ensure there's a, a cross section? Right there, there are two there there are two different survey options. So on every on the tagline of all the ORM employees, we have a survey that anyone can click to be responsive. But what we did this last fiscal year, after you talked about listening sessions and, and following up with individuals, what we did was we made an affirmative effort to follow up with all with a lot of injured workers and ask them. How is your medical care? You know, what's going on? How is, are you getting your, your durable medical equipment? How is your provider? You know, what, what's going on to understand whether or not there are problems or challenges that we need to work on. So those are the data and statistics about how people are saying things are going well and things are going better. Um, and so uh, we, we, we call them, we talk to them, we note down all of their responses, we give them the opportunity to fill out additional survey information if they want, and if they raise problems, we'll also work to address those. But mainly we're focused on, you know, getting the information about how is their care going, and, uh, you know, you, you provided this statistic about how people are responsive, that they're, they're generally been happy with their care. And when they're not, we're more than happy to then follow up to try and address it. The um, the risk management council. Who, who's on that uh, council? Yeah, the risk management council is made up of agency risk management representatives. We call them ARMRs, and so each uh, there are over fifty of them in the district, and they're basically employees at each agency assigned to deal with risk management issues. And so what we'll do is we'll, every other month, we get together and we train or we talk about topics of mutual interest um, and try and provide them with information about better risk management practices. We'll do a training on workers' compensation, or we'll talk, we'll have somebody come in and talk about ergonomics and like safety for employees, or we'll talk about um, different methodologies for our system, right? You, you know, this is what you need to do from an e-risk perspective, or we'll work with them on, on lot tort liabilities, on negligence matters that happen with their agency. So um, we'll, we'll, we've done training for active threats, active shooters. And so we'll bring in people from MPD to then train them on that or work with HCMA about what people should know about for emergencies that are happening in the district. And they meet, so, but it said the website says they meet bi-monthly. Is that every, every other month? month. Okay. Every other month, yep. Okay. They're, def they're definitely the lifeblood of risk management for the district because we, of course, can't be everywhere, do everything. And so then when there's problems at agencies, they become kind of our points of contact. Some of them are professional risk managers, meaning that the job is actually a risk manager and other smaller agencies, of course, they might have a, you know, a, a, a different employee with this being additional duties for them. Um. <clears throat> 
you you don't take attendance at, at those. Why 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 not? Um, so during the pandemic, it's been a lot harder. When before the pandemic, we would we would have a sign in sheet and we would take an attendance from that perspective. So I, I will circle back with the staff to make sure that they're following up so we can get that information in a more accurate way. Um, but I, I do know that we, um, we historically had sign in sign out sheets for sure. Um, but I think during the pandemic, it's been a little bit more difficult with uh, people coming in and out from all the uh, electronic teams calls would be my guess. Okay. But I will get back to you on that council member. Thank you. Um, I think we spoke about potholes last year, but the uh, the trends that that you showed over the past four fiscal years indicate that potholes continue to be the most common claim the district receives. Has have you advocated for any changes to reduce this issue in the long term? Definitely, I regularly talk to um, I regularly talk with the directors of DDOT um, and advocate for them to, to undertake additional steps in safety. I'll also say that there was an increased effort. Um, by DDOT and more funding was given to them in order to continue to do more and more road work. So I know that that's actually happening. Um, and I think that comparative to where we were four years ago, five years ago, there were many, many, many more claims. So I think there has been a reduction and we might be a little closer to baseline. But obviously, there's a lot of roadway in the District of Columbia and fixing it all, all the time, um, especially with bad weather, it gets to be very difficult. And that's the goal of DDOT. Um, and we work with them regularly uh, to try and address it and kind of give them statistics and data around it um, in order to, to ensure that there's less damage to vehicles. I think, you know, overall, six, seven hundred, something like that could happen. Um, some are valid, some are not valid. Um, generally, out of the the population of 700,000 residents, it's its not um, such a, an outlier. And, and I would argue probably is a lot less than, than uh, you know, New York and other jurisdictions, but, but nonetheless, it continues to be something that, you know, we work with DDOT on and, and, and advocate for, and they've been doing a great job, uh, you know, fixing potholes in the city. We have to compare ourselves to New York, then that's a- uh, I would, we, you know, <laughs> Baltimore as well, I would say, so, yeah. <laughs> Um, in, um, in, in fiscal year 20, you counted the amount of Department of Corrections claims and prisoners claims, but since then, I don't see this being counted in FY 21 or 22. Why is that? Uh, we definitely have that data, council member. So I can look to find out what that is. Uh, uh, try and give you a, an answer if I'm able. Um, for DOC. So they generally what happens is we list the top 10 or top five, and it might be that just this year they'd actually weren't in the highest number. So actually there was a reduction comparatively to other agencies who had higher numbers, but we have that data and I'm happy to provide it to you and the committee. I appreciate it. Of course. <clears throat> and I mean, I should note that looking at the risk map for FY21 and 22 outlining the location for all tort and workers compensation claims reflects that the DC jail continues to be the area with by far the highest claims. Um, <clears throat> what are we doing to, to address that issue? Sure, actually one thing that we've undertaken is we're working very closely with DGS and the Department of Corrections. So Pat Healy, who is uh, the program administrator over our risk prevention and safety department has been meeting regularly with DGS and with DOC to talk about um, managing matters there, uh, you know, supporting from a, a facility perspective, trying to help to make it as safe as possible. And so we are actively working with them on a regular occurrence in a not a task force or a work group, but um, in a dedicated way where we're regularly following up. Um, so it is it is something that um, we've spiked up our efforts um, and DGS has been monumentally awesome. Um, they continue to need resources. Um, they, they've been monumentally, monumentally awesome in supporting DOC and, and, and DOC leadership has spoken about how positive they've been. So, um, yeah, we continue to to support it there. What what I'll say is there were um, you know uh, 
there are a lot of challenges and a lot of them are capital construction related ones that take a lot of time, uh, but we're, we're consistently pushing um, and advocating and supporting and documenting along with them. And I know that there've been risk assessments gone, you know, there've been, uh, I will say walkthroughs to like identify challenges and concerns to help support um, keep making things even better. So a, a, a significant number of, of the um, workers' comp claims and, and injuries have been due to facilities issues? No, 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 no. That's um, no, just um, after all that happened after uh, January 6th, there's just been a, a consistent effort to say that the facility isn't as good and we are making active efforts to ensure that it is. I will say it's not necessarily facility mm -hmm. related. I will say, given the type of work, um, just like DDOT work or DPW work, the likelihood of entering into a physical circumstance and resulting in an in, in injury um, is much higher. You know, it's just, uh, it just kind of goes with the type of work. So um, I think we, uh, I don't think that there's been some significant increase one way or another different from where where things are. Um, we have uh, 19 active tort claims from that office. That's where where people have claimed that there have been violations in their rights or access to something, some type of, of, of liability claim. And then we have active workers' compensation claims, which might just be medical care, other things. Um, we have around 75, but that goes back for, you know, since the since the 60s or 70s that those claims are active. So it's not like the biggest numbers. I think recent claims are not, um, there hasn't been a significant spike or increase, but we continue to wanna be concerned about it and protect people and make sure things are doing properly. Um, so just wanted to make sure you kind of had those numbers. As I said, I would get them to you. Um. You're, you're a member of the advisory committee to the Office of Administrative Hearings. Is, is I am. that right? I am. Um, what, is it, have, what is your participation in that uh, committee been like in uh, FY22? It's been fantastic. Um, I think uh, Chief Judge Curry has done a great job. I think she is, is, is doing a great job. It's open. It's, a, it's open to, our ad, to advocates, to the community, to administrative law judges to speak about their own concerns. Um, so, uh, you know, chaired by, by Betsy Cavendish, um, I will just say she's been phenomenal. Um, we, we, we as a group continue to provide a very open forum. We provide um, ideas and suggestions to the Office of Administrative Hearings uh, to help them. They have a lot of challenges for technical and staffing, um, but I think they're doing an excellent job to kind of weather through and, and, and advance things to make more access for, for individuals, to providing attorneys, um, uh, pro bono attorneys there to support individuals who want to file um, administrative hearings. So I think it's, it's moving in, a, in an excellent direction and something I'm, I'm happy to participate in and support, um, you know, as a long-term government employee, something that I think is really important and, and think they're doing an excellent job for it. Last year, last fiscal year, the captive insurance agency experienced some spending pressure causing the use of $3.2 million in contingency funding. Uh, you're now reporting the same spending pressure in the form of an unexpected increase in policy premiums for renewing the, the district's real property insurance and cyber liability insurance policies. So what, what are you doing differently to ensure ORM will not need to resort to contingency funding again? So um, what I will say is uh, we, when we plan for our, um, when we plan for insurance costs, you know, the insurance marketplace changes very commonly and very readily. And so um, it's, we're basically going out to the marketplace looking for the best insurance for the district's, ins you know, real property or other insurance policies. And dependent upon whatever the insurance marketplace dictates, those are the rates that we pay. So one of the things that we try to do is to affirmatively and actively mitigate um, issues that the insurance carriers might look at and say are problems. So when they come, they're, they're rating the district as high as possible. So then we're going to get better insurance rates. And a lot of that comes with DGS and our partnerships there um, in many other scenarios, but making sure that they can be doing preventative maintenance and fixing things. Um, so 
we're able to then prevent losses from happening. So in the last fiscal year, we, we had two real property losses, pretty sizable ones. And of course, whenever you have an insurance loss that can impact your rates. And so as it was, the insurance marketplace was increasing rates year over year over the last couple of years. It had been a very soft market for I think like 14 quarters. And then from that point, there were big losses, um, whether it were hurricanes or other natural disasters that really impacted the market and the insurance carriers started raising rates. And it wasn't just one company, it was all companies. So- well, what, were the, what were the two ma major losses that, that you- There was uh, one school had a ceiling collapse mm -hmm. and then um, a trash transfer station had a fire. And so um, those, you know, those got reported. We're obviously collect, you know, working to collect for the taxpayers on those insurance policies. Um, but all those things have impacts on your insurance rates. So we're actively every year doing everything we can to, um, you know, show that we are good partners, show the district's protecting its own assets, doing its things that it needs to do in order to keep our rates down. And also an additional <laughs> amount of the funding, just to be clear, was related to an increase in cyber security insurance. Okay. And just as you know, everywhere rates are going up, cyber incidents happening more and more. And as a result, there were significant increases. I will also say, because we had done such a good job and my insurance team, Jane Waters and the team had done such a good job, we were paying under the market. You know, We were getting the benefit of low rates for many, many years. And then there have been increases based on the fact that they're kind of correcting back to where the marketplace is. But we continue to advocate in every arena um, to, to make sure that we're getting the best rates possible and the most coverage for those rates. It, of the 1,231 tort claims filed in fiscal year 20, only 389 were settled and paid. Of the 1,340 filed in fiscal year 21, only 346 were settled. Uh, this indicated a drift toward more tort claims are being filed while less are being settled. Why, why is that? So the one challenge with tort claims, I think it was like 2000 in that prior year. I think one of the challenges with tort claims is that we're going to settle the cases when we have liability and the damages being requested are reasonable. Um, and what will happen is we don't know when a loss will happen or what damage or you know, people will get hurt, whatever might happen. We don't have any control of that. So, so one year we might have 20 people get hurt. The next year we might have 50 people get hurt. Um, so whatever the facts might be, just it, it's a matter of the cycles. It just happens. There is no direct definitive pinpoint cycle. But what I will say is we work to settle each and every claim when the district taxpayers uh, are, are going to have to pay for it from a liability perspective. However, what will happen is we'll have individuals who will file claims demanding millions of dollars for, you know, their car, you know, a tire being broken, uh, you know, on a pothole. And so if we're unable to come to an agreement on that settlement, which we're only one side of that settlement agreement then we may just have to say, we deny the claim, we cannot pay you something that's unreasonable. And ultimately we can't settle it. I will also say a number of the claims, whenever there's a need for discovery or litigation, we're never gonna be able to discuss, you know, settle that case because we don't have subpoena power to do discovery. And so any complex uh, claim that comes in, overly complex claim where there's gonna be expert witnesses and things of that sort, those matters are going to almost always go to the Office of the Attorney General and be litigated so long as those parties file litigation. So the, 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 the numbers that we have are actually pretty good. And we, we settle, you know, the, the settlement judgment fund has, you know, $26 million roundabouts. So we'll, we'll settle cases wherever, wherever we have liability for sure. Uh, so, I mean, this is less than a third of the cases settled and paid. That, that's a good uh, rate? I, I, you know, each case is really specific and individual. I, I, in my goal, the, the, the more cases we settle, the better it is for reducing judicial, you know, burdens, uh, wasting time, getting people what they deserve. My team does an amazing job. They're all very 
seasoned expert professionals. They've been doing this for many, many years. They're very responsive. They get things done. We need the agencies to give us the data so we can accept or deny the liability. We built wonderful inroads and in partnering with agencies on that. So I think that I think those numbers are totally. That it, unfortunately, those are just almost like workload measures. They're just numbers about what happens. But you know, as I said, I can't control if the other side doesn't want to settle the case for for what's proper or what's reasonable. Um, and then you know, the courts will decide and, and it gets worked out. But when people come and say, "I'm owed this amount of money based on this <laughs> on these specific facts," and they provide us the evidence, we settle the case. Um, so I, I think it's you know, each one has to be looked at independently, but. The team is not, there's no withholding of monies or anything of that sort. It's our goal and effort to close the matter out so people can get back to their lives. Um, let, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm driving, you know, at, at night and I, I hit a pothole. By the time I get home, my tire's flat. I file a claim. What, what does that process look like? Yeah, so one of the really great things that we've done during the pandemic is we've enabled people to be able to file what's called a 12309 claim. So anytime you think the district government has harmed your property or you, they can file a claim with our office. So they could go online and they could fill out all the data. If they've taken photos, they can upload that information. It's fantastic. They're also able to mail it in or uh, fax it in, uh, well, mail it in or to hand deliver it or, or file it online. And so you would basically fill out the form saying, you know, this is what happened at this time it has to be location specific. We have to be able to pinpoint whether or not there was a notification of that pothole in that location. And then we make sure that we then reach out to the agency and, and we get it. So everything has to be documented to provide proof of the damages. Why does it matter if there was a, uh, a notice of that pothole? Uh, sorry, what about the notice of that bottle? You, you said there has to, there has to have been notice of that right. bottle. The agency we the the agency DDOT in that instance would have to have active or constructive notice of the particular problem in order to have then failed to meet its obligation to fix it um, for when that damage happened. So you know. Basically, you could go online at night, you take your photos, you'd say at, at 9 p.m. this happened at this location, mm -hmm. here's my photos, here's my proof of my evidence of, of what occurred. Um, and then we would then reach out to the agency and say, okay, did you fix this? What did this not get fixed? What happened here? And we kind of go through the facts and then we reach back out. Um, once we've ascertained that yes, DDOT failed to do something, they didn't meet their burden. And then all, then we would say, okay, we accept a, not a liability. What are your damages? What are the costs? And then they would sit, they would provide, you know, the, the, the body shop receipts for whatever was done or whatever it might be. Um, we, of course, if they haven't fixed it, then we ask them to get multiple bids in order to get the best price on behalf of the taxpayers. Of course, we want them to be put back into the position that they were in. Um, and so we kind of just go through that normal, typical process and, um, we're very, the team is very good. When I started, there were like well over 2000 open tort claims. And now we're down under 500 and, and you're not getting, you know, the council and nobody's complaining every day. I'm not getting complaints every day. It just shows you how efficient the team is at being responsive to everybody and mm -hmm. getting matters resolved, um, and, and solving the problem. So they're, they're doing excellent work, you know, uh, I, you know, I can't be more proud of, of my of my wonderful uh, colleagues in my office. That's great. So, so in in this uh, hypothetical, if I submit a claim and, and DDOT says no, we we were not aware of that pothole, then the district would not compensate the, the resident. We didn't breach any burdens, uh, you know, any duties to anyone in that circumstance, and we would deny the claim and say we're not we're not responsible. We weren't the ones, you know, we didn't we didn't fail to meet a burden. And then in the, in the event that the individual didn't agree, they're always able to then bring a, a claim. So whether, whether if it's under the dollar threshold in small claims court, they can file that and then the attorney general will work to represent us. If it's something more significant, then you know, they file in superior court. And again, OAG will represent us in, in defending the district. Um, but generally the law and the rules are pretty established and, and, and 
full throated in terms of how 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 it should be managed. We're pretty good and efficient um, at responding and explaining. Um, doesn't mean that people are always happy, but ultimately that's also why we ask individuals. That's why individuals should have their own insurance, and then they would go to their insurance carrier. You, in this instance, if the you know it just happened ten minutes, you know some truck was driving down the road, it dropped something really heavy, created that pothole, and then you drove over it right afterwards, um, and then damaged your vehicle. That's why you have vehicle insurance and your vehicle insurance then would, would put you back into the place where you were. The district didn't fail some burden. We would, of course, need to get out there and fix it and fix it timely. But it wasn't necessarily us um, who, 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 who breached a duty. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Um, last fiscal year, you mentioned that ORM will work to collect better data on race to identify ways to improve racial equity. What process, progress have you made in this area? So yeah, um, in that area, what we've done is, you know, what we're uh, allowing individuals to report the information to us was through our e-risk system. You know, it's, it should never be an obligation for somebody to report their race in order to get a claim filed. Um, but really, that's kind of where our most effective data is around. Um, if the individuals want to file a claim, whatever type of claim, you know, a liability claim or workers' comp claim to be able to provide that data to us, then we'll have information on if, if there are, are, are things happening or trends happening that are, are wrong uh, based on race. Um, but of course, we, we, we can't and we won't ever make it an obligation because if an individual thinks the district taxpayer, the districts harm them somehow or some way, we obviously have to meet our legal burdens to be responsive and, and settle their case and, and can't hold that out. But we've created a, an opportunity for them to report it, which then enables us to have more data to, to say, you know, these types of issues are happening more predominantly in this particular circumstance or that circumstance. And then- I'm we sorry, can, where would that be reported? In our e-risk system. E so, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, Director Ross, I, I want to thank you very much and thank your team as well. Uh, th those are all the questions I have. So I want to thank you for, for being with us uh, today. And uh, we look forward to working with you as we move into the budget season soon. Thank you so much, Council Member. Appreciate your time. Appreciate all the witnesses and happy to support anybody. Should they have any concerns, they can always reach out. I know my team is, is ready to be responsive. So thank you and thank you your, to your committee. We really appreciate all your work. Thanks so much. Uh, next, we will welcome Interim Director uh, Nen Kine of the Office of Human Rights and Chairperson uh, Matoko Azawa of the Commission on Human Rights. Welcome. Good afternoon, council member. Can you hear me? I can, I can. How are you doing today? Pretty well, thank you. How about you? I'm doing well. <laughs> doing well, thank you. Uh, Chair Azawa, uh, very good to see you as well. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, will it just be uh, you two who, who will uh, testify and answer questions or will other people from your team uh, answer questions? Councilmember, I have Ayana Lee, our HR manager, who I may defer to for certain questions, as well as um, our chief judge, Erica Pearson, uh, as well as our AFO, Adrena Dean, all of whom you see on the screen here. Um, I also have my deputy director here. I'm not sure if he's on the panelists yet. All right, well, we will give a second to get anyone who might answer questions. I want to swear everyone in at the same time, so we'll get everyone on the uh, uh, they, I think people will have to turn their cameras on. Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> Director, is, is that everyone? Yes. 
It looks like it is. Thank you. Good to see all of you uh, and welcome. It is the practice of this committee to put all of our government witnesses under oath. So I would ask everyone to raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to provide to the committee on government operations and facilities is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Wonderful. All right. Well, thanks so I much. Do. I do. All right, um, and you can feel free to uh, to turn your cameras off and, and uh, in, until the appropriate time, and um, we will um, uh, start with uh, Director Kahn. Uh, you can begin your testimony when you're ready. Thank you, Chairperson. Good afternoon, Chairperson White, committee members, and staff of the Committee on Government Operations. My name is Nin Kai, and I currently serve as Interim Director of the DC Office of Human Rights. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss OHR's growth and accomplishments in fiscal years 2021 and 2022 to date. I will begin with an overview of OHR and the laws we enforce. The Office of Human Rights began its work in 1977 to provide administrative relief for violations of civil rights that occur in the district. Generally speaking, this relief process is divided into two parts. Part one requires OHR to make a determination as to whether there's probable cause to believe discrimination may have occurred. If OHR finds probable cause, then part two is triggered, which involves certification of the case for a public hearing on the merits. OHR's enforcement areas include employment, housing, public accommodations, government services, and educational institutions. In terms of the laws from 1977 to 2000, OHR was responsible for enforcing three laws, the Human Rights Act, the DC Family and Medical Leave Act, and the DC Parental Leave Act. Then in the first two decades of the new millennium, the following laws were added, in addition to expansions to the Human Rights Act. In 2004, the Language Access Act became law, and later the Youth Bullying Prevention Act in 2012, the Unemployed Anti-Discrimination Act also in 2012, the Fair Criminal Record Screening Amendment Act, popularly known as Ban the Box in 2014, and soon thereafter, the Fair Criminal Record Screening for Housing Act followed in 2017, and the Protecting Pregnant Workers Fairness Act in 2015. In 2017, credit information was added as the 20th protected trait under the Human Rights Act. In 2019, the Employment Protections for Victims of Domestic Violence Sexual Offenses and Stalking Amendment Act became law also as part of the Human Rights Act. The following year, in 2020, parts of the Universal Paid Leave Act became effective for OHR's enforcement. And most recently in 2021, OHR began its work on implementing parts of the Tipped Wage Workers Fairness Act, the Racial Equity Achieves Results Act, and the Care for LGBTQ Seniors and Seniors with HIV Amendment Act. In addition to the laws I just mentioned, OHR has work sharing agreements with our federal partners, the EEOC and the US Department of Housing and Urban Development to investigate claims filed under titles seven and eight of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. All in all, I am proud to say, OHR enforces approximately 18 civil rights and employment laws in the district. OHR is also home to the Commission on Human Rights, which is composed of 15 public commissioners who are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the council. The commission is supported by two administrative law judges from the Office of Human Rights. Through an appointment of tribunals of commissioners, the commission adjudicates private sector discrimination complaints once OHR issues a probable cause finding that discrimination may have occurred. The ALJs also hear public sector cases in which OHR issues a finding of probable cause against DC government respondents. I will now turn to OHR's key achievements, starting with our enforcement work and then continue to programmatic accomplishments and community engagement efforts. OHR's enforcement unit is made up of a team of mediators and three teams, soon to be four, of investigators and intake officers. These teams are supported by attorney advisors from the OHR's Office of the General Counsel, and the hearings are held by our ALJs. In FY21, OHR received 1,059 initial inquiries, 
docketed 331 charges of discrimination and closed 303 cases. OHR's mandatory mediation program conducted 390 mediation sessions of which 185 cases were settled, resulting in approximately $2.6 million in payments to complainants. I'm proud to add that for FY21 and to date, over 90% of docketed cases at OHR were scheduled for mediation within 45 days. Last year, we sought to achieve this goal in 80% of the cases. And as you can see, we were not only able to meet, but also exceeded this goal. With respect to cases certified for a public hearing, OHR's attorneys actively litigated in a total of 17 probable cause findings in FY21 and to date. While our ALJs closed a total of eight cases in FY21, five of which were private sector and three were government cases. Prior to reaching a full evidentiary hearing, which is very similar to a trial, the parties may resolve the matter through a settlement conference facilitated by one of the ALJs. During this time, OHR's attorneys work towards securing the public interest, which includes a make whole relief for victims of discrimination and a voluntary compliance agreement in which a respondent must agree to conduct specific trainings under district laws, modify its policies and notices uh, as necessary, and for a certain period of time, report to OHR regarding any updates or changes to these applicable policies or notices. At present, OHR is monitoring 12 of these compliance agreements. In addition to the foregoing, I am delighted to report that as of May 2021, OHR had 61 open gender neutral bathroom cases. And by the end of the fiscal year, with the help of a contractor, OHR was able to close all of these cases. I will now turn to our programmatic accomplishments and highlight our work in four areas as follows. One, COVID related issuances. Two, OHR's outreach and educational program. Three, language access. And four, our work in the TIP Wage Workers Fairness Act. From the outset of the pandemic, OHR worked internally and in partnership with our sister government agencies to ensure employees and employers were aware of developing protections in the district during these unprecedented times. For example, in August 2020, OHR issued its first COVID-19 guidance detailing information about the new COVID-19 leave available under the DC FMLA. Subsequently, OHR issued a second guidance in August 2021 this guidance was updated in January of this year to reflect amendments made by the council's legislation. Also in January, OHR issued a special guidance on religious accommodation as a surge of accommodation requests accompanied the vaccine mandates. As of mid-February of this year, OHR has already received over 80 complaints regarding COVID-related accommodation requests. To respond to the surge in cases, OHR is presently working to bring contractors to assist the enforcement unit. As the law continues to develop in these areas, OHR and its legal unit work diligently to ensure that public is aware of the changes and receives easy to understand information on the protections that exist for employees as well as the obligations placed upon employers. As OHR's mandates grow, so must our educational and outreach programs. To that end, I would like to spend the next few minutes discussing the breadth and progress of our programs, both internally and externally. In FY21 and 22 to date, OHR made a targeted effort to expand our reach by conducting trainings and meetings with the advisory neighborhood commissions. This work was completed by our outreach team together with the language access team. As a result of this internal collaboration, I'm happy to report that despite the pandemic, we reach all of the wards in the city, educating communities about the important laws and protections OHR enforces. Additionally, our community engagement specialists at these meetings spoke to several ANC commissioners individually, informing them about their constituents' rights and how to file a complaint with OHR. In addition, OHR continues to partner and collaborate with the Mayor's Office of Community Affairs, Ethnic Constituency Offices, as well as the federal EEOC. In FY22, OHR has been focused on tailoring our outreach to the needs of the community by identifying and working with community partners to ensure there is intersectionality and a wide cross-section that represents DC's diversity. Some of the newer organizations OHR has been working with include SMILE, the Gay Men's Chorus, and the DC Lactation Commission. 
In addition to working with community-based organizations, OHR is also prioritizing reaching individuals in the community in order to better serve the needs of our constituents. To that end, OHR is planning on resuming its listening labs to connect with individual community members versus organizations. And we expect to relaunch this program sometime between March and April of this year. As the name implies, though the sessions will focus on listening to community members, OHR will of course also provide educational materials and information during these sessions. Currently, the initial relaunch will provide a general OHR overview and discrimination protections in the district, while remaining sessions will offer information on fair housing accessibility, LGBTQ plus protections, and information for mothers and families. Internally within the district government in FY21, OHR continued its three-day EEO training programs for the district government employees, as well as our partnership with DCHR, delivering day-long training for the district's sexual harassment officers. Most recently, on February 15, 2022, OHR delivered a special training on reasonable accommodations related to COVID to help our EEO counselors, managers, and others gain a better understanding of this process and our recently published guidance on this issue. In FY21, OHR's Language Access Director, Rosa Carrillo worked diligently not only to oversee the smooth processing of complaints and provide technical assistance, but she also established partnerships and meaningful relationships with our stakeholders to produce significant achievements. For example, last year, her efforts helped to achieve a fully functional translated website of the Department of Employment Services in Spanish. Lastly, I'm thrilled to report that the Metropolitan Police Department has uploaded the Language Line Solution app on all MPD officers' cell phones, which will make it tremendously easier and faster to connect with an interpreter when they are interacting with the LEP NEP residents in the field. Lastly, in FY22, I wanna share that OHR participated in the DC Language Access Coalition's Know Your Rights training on February 5th, 2022, that garnered the attendance of approximately 85 Spanish and Amharic speakers who had the opportunity to share their language access experiences, as well as learn about their language rights in the District of Columbia. This high attendance rate is attributable to the deep dedication and commitment of the DC Language Access Coalition stakeholders and OHR's language access team. In FY21, OHR also achieved significant milestones in implementing the new Tipped Wage Workers Fairness Act, a part of which requires OHR to develop notice materials, develop training materials and certify trainers, build a reporting system for employers, and work with the Tipped Wage Council. To date, OHR has achieved the following. One, we've actively, actively participated in the Tipped Wage Council, developed a fact sheet on the law called Got Tips, Got Rights, which includes a QR code, we're very proud of this, to take readers directly to OHR's website. And the document is available in Amharic, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, and French. We also developed the sexual harassment training content, which is being reviewed by OHR's legal team, as well as working, as well as by a working group of community advocates and service providers, as required by law. And we also created an online platform on OHR's website for businesses to start registering and submitting any documentation related to this law. Looking ahead in FY22, OHR has several priorities and goals, but today I will highlight our top five goals, which are one, reducing backlog, two, rebuilding OHR, three, completing the case management system, four, racial equity, and five, OHR industry standard study. Regarding our goal to reduce backlog in FY22, OHR plans on achieving this long-term goal through several new means. First, OHR is currently in the process of creating a separate backlog team known and dearly as the SWAT team, dedicated specifically to targeting resolution of older cases. Second, OHR is working on adding a process called fact-finding conference to fast-track certain cases for resolution. Third, OHR has implemented backlog reduction as a goal in employees' performance plans. Fourth, OHR is implementing an employee incentive plan. 
Finally, OHR continues to actively recruit and fill additional investigator, manager, and attorney positions in order to establish sufficient support for the number of cases OHR receives. In fact, Chairperson, I'm happy to report that through our robust hiring efforts, we have been able to add more investigators to the enforcement team such that OHR has reduced an average case load from 60 to 80 in years past to the current status of an average of 38 cases per investigator. As OHR grows, it is working on bringing more accountability, clear responsibility areas, hierarchy, and structure to the agency by reorganizing the senior leadership structure, assessing current staffing levels, and forecasting future staffing level needs, creating additional support positions as needed, such as program support staff, information technology staff, and data analysts, and revamping the case processing structure. Additionally, to increase retention, OHR is working on implementing programs to recognize staff for their achievements and to provide a career path at OHR and within the District of Columbia government. Finally, OHR is working on strengthening its relationship with our commissioners through additional educational materials, outreach opportunities, and increased coordination. With respect to our third goal regarding case management system, OHR plans to complete phase two of its case management system so that OHR can better manage, track, and obtain data necessary to issue our reports and to better understand our progress. This effort also includes ensuring that the Commission on Human Rights has an efficient means for managing its cases. With respect to our number four goal, racial equity, uh, as part of this work, together with OCA's Office on Racial Equity, OHR will create multi-use educational resource guides for ORE's government-facing training series. The resource guides will cover inclusive language and best practice guides related to quelling racism against people that identify as part of the African diaspora, Asian and Pacific Islander, Latin American, and Middle Eastern communities. Once finalized, these materials will be published on OHR's website. As mentioned above, OHR is also relaunching its listening labs to better understand and serve the needs of our various vulnerable communities. As for our final fifth goal, we are hoping to achieve work with the industry standard study in order to learn best practices and subsequently improve OHR's own processes. OHR uh, will provide additional updates as they develop. In conclusion, Chairperson, I wanna say that I'm very proud of one, the resilience of the team at OHR, despite having experienced multiple transitions and challenges. Two, the progress we have made and our commitment to continue to improve OHR's systems and infrastructure because we recognize the deep impact of our work on the communities we serve. And three, our unwavering efforts to collaborate and connect with community partners. I, along with the entire team at OHR, am excited about our path forward for the year ahead, as this is a pivotal point in OHR's journey. Finally, I want to take this opportunity to thank former directors Monica Palacio and Michelle Garcia for their dedication and exceptional leadership of OHR and FY21 and 20 respectively, where I step on their shoulders in leading OHR to our new chapter. Of course, I would also like to thank you, Chairperson White, and committee members for your leadership and support for the work of OHR. We appreciate the opportunity to share accomplishments and plans for continuous, continuous improvement and look forward to continuing to work with you and the committee. This concludes my testimony and I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Chairperson Aizawa, you can begin your testimony when you are ready. Thank you and good afternoon, Chairperson White, committee members and staff of the Committee on Government Operations. My name is Motoko Aizawa and I serve as the chair of the District of Columbia's Commission on Human Rights. Thank you for inviting me to discuss the activities and accomplishments of the commission in fiscal year 2021 and fiscal year 2022 to date. The commission is an administrative body that adjudicates cases under the DC Human Rights Act. We are composed of commissioners from the public who are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the council. The commission's work is supported by administrative law judges or ALJs employed by the Office of Human Rights. 
Currently, there are 11 commissioners and four vacancies. Recently, the commission submitted recommendations for three new commissioners who were selected from applications received by the Mayor's Office of Talent and Appointments and are awaiting for confirmation hearings. And we continue to seek applicants for the remaining vacancy. As you know, the Office of Human Rights was established to provide administrative relief for violations of civil rights laws that occur in the district. This begins with a complaint, which is mediated, investigated, and if applicable, conciliated. There are two types of cases, public sector cases, which are filed against the DC government and private sector cases filed against non-government entities. The former cases are adjudicated by the ALJs, whereas in the latter cases, if OHR finds probable cause for discrimination and conciliation has failed, the case is certified for a public hearing on the merits before the commission. The commission is currently supported by two ALJs with a chief ALJ directing the day-to-day -day activities and responsible for tracking and managing the commission's case docket. They preside over the Private Sector Human Rights Act cases as well as ban the box cases once they have been certified by the OHR for hearing. Before proceeding to the full evidentiary hearing, the ALJs issue a scheduling order under which the parties are allowed to exchange discovery and motions for summary judgment are considered after discovery has concluded. The presiding ALJ then conducts a full hearing, much like a trial, where the parties are afforded opportunities to present their evidence, including witnesses. Once the full hearing is completed, the ALJ assigned to the case will request a tribunal of three commissioners to review the case and a final order prepared by the ALJ. The tribunal then meets to discuss the case and either adopts, amends, or rejects the order proposed by the ALJ. Once the decision is finalized, it is issued to the parties. The commission meets bi-monthly to discuss tribunal assignments, progress on resolution of cases pending with the commission, committee work, and any other activities undertaken by the commission. Some of these activities include participating in tra training to keep the commissioners updated on changes and relevant uh, DC laws and regulations and uh, partnering with community organizations. The commission and OHR also co-sponsor annual events to commemorate International Human Rights Month in December. I will now turn to our key achievements from FY 2021 to date. Compared to a year ago, we find ourselves in a more stable condition, ably assisted by the two ALJs and working closely with OHR. We're making steady progress in addressing the backlog of cases. The ALJs and the commission continue to operate remotely, holding virtual meetings and hearings, offering flexibility to move cases uh, forward virtually. In FI21, the Commission worked with the ALJs to close five cases. Unlawful discriminatory practices were substantiated in one case. Two cases were approved uh, settlements. One case was judgment in favor of the employer and one case was withdrawn. In addition, the ALJ uh, closed four public sector cases. As of October 1, 2021, 15 private sector cases and five public sector cases were pending before the commission. In FY22 to date, the commission has helped to close four cases, one of which substantiated discriminatory practices, two were judgments in favor of the employer, and one was involuntarily dismissed for failure to prosecute. 16 cases are pending before the commission as of February 7, 2022. In FI 21, the commission reinstated several committees to help us discharge our responsibilities more effectively after some of them became inactive. We now have a rules committee, an awards committee, and a new outreach committee. The rules committee worked with OHR to draft an emergency amendment to section 408 
of chapter four of uh, District of Columbia Municipal Regulations or DCMR regarding representation. In addition, uh, the committee established an internal rule designed to ensure commissioners avoid conflicts of interest in tribunals. Under the leadership of the awards committee and the outreach committee, the commission successfully held its in-person annual human rights awards gala in December, 2021, at which Christy Respress, executive Di director of Pathway to Housing DC, and Jaya Lala, the Global Classroom uh, Program Coordinator of the United Nations Association of the Nation's Capital Area, were awarded the Cornelius R. Neal Alexander Humanitarian Award and a New Emerging Leader Award, respectively. In addition, Chief uh, ALJ Erica Pearson uh, created the first commissioner manual, which sets forth the responsibilities of the commissioners, the laws of the commission enforces and other useful information. Chief Judge Pearson also led onboarding training for new commissioners in addition to creating the, uh, the manual. These initiatives were especially well received by the new commissioners. Moving on to our priorities for FY22, the commission has identified the following five actions to achieve in the current fiscal year. Our first priority is to move cases efficiently from certification to closure, with a focus on closing the oldest cases. To this end, the ALJs hope to encourage more dispute resolution through settlement conferences and to improve the case management system. Second, the ALJ would like to make it easier for unrepresented litigants to bring complaints by offering fillable forms and a litigation manual that is accessible. Third, the commission is planning to collaborate with OHR to revise the procedural rules in chapter four of the DCMR. Our objectives are to ensure consistency with other applicable rules in the district and to clarify or update certain provisions. Fourth, we are also hoping to collaborate with OHR to compile data on past commission cases to better understand case trends. We will be working on identifying the scope of the analysis and indicators shortly. Finally, we plan to reach out to DC residents about the protection that the DC human rights affords through systematic outreach activities alongside OHR and by making the human rights gala and other community events more accessible. In closing, the Commission on Human Rights believes its work has a positive impact on the quality of life of DC residents. We're excited about our FY22 priorities and look forward to a close collaboration with OHR in the promotion and advancement of the district's non-discrimination standards under the, hum under the Human Rights Act. Before I close, I would like to thank you, Chairman uh, White, for your leadership and support for the work of the Commission. We appreciate the opportunity to share our accomplishments and plans for continuous improvement and look forward to continuing to work with you and the Committee on Government Operations. I'm available to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you both uh, very much. Um, uh, certainly uh, excited and grateful for a lot of progress that has happened uh, over the, the past year. Uh, so let, let's jump into questions. Uh, my first questions will be primarily directed toward uh, Director Khan, uh, and, uh, and uh, then I will have some questions directed uh, primarily uh, to you, Chair Aizawa. Uh, Director Khan, I, I want to start with your case backlog. Uh, we asked some questions about this before the hearing, but to be clear, how many cases are currently pending before OHR? There are about 700 cases pending before OHR, Chairperson. Okay. How does that compare to the start of the fiscal year? Um, I'm not sure how that compares to the start of the year. I'd have to get back to you, but I'd be happy to get back to you. I'd appreciate it. And it uh, looks like you closed 227 cases in fiscal year 21, uh, but docketed 331 new cases. How do you ensure that you're able to close more cases than you you have coming in to sort of prevent, you know, uh, 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 further backlog? 
right? And that and that's exactly why we're creating this uh, specific hated fourth team, um, which I know you've heard us say a, a number of times now, called the SWAT team, um, to actually tackle these older cases. So this new team will tackle these older cases. So exactly as you pointed out, Council Member. Uh, the current team will not have cases becoming backlogged because they're dealing with older cases. Because our, pro our procedure was to tackle older cases first. So then if your caseload is high, all the newer cases are becoming backlogged because mm -hmm. the clock is ticking the minute they come through the door. So this way, when we take out these um, older cases, age cases to a separate team that can just dive in, tackle in, you know, dedicate it solely to these older cases, it gives the, the, the current team an opportunity to ensure that these newer cases that are coming in are not backlogged. So that's one way. But we're also inputting um, things like fact finding conferences to expedite the process. This is something that OHR had done maybe about a decade and a half ago, uh, but I wanna bring that back as other uh, organizations similar to our agency conducts these fact finding conferences that should help expedite the process. Um, Another way, again, is to ensure that the teams have a manageable size, again, so that we do not get backlogged in our case numbers. So I hope that answered your question. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so 57 cases closed in fiscal year 21 and 19 of the cases closed this year had been open for three or more years. What, what can we do to keep cases from lingering that long? Again, Council Member, I, I think we already have identified a number of cases, which are about 136 that are aged, that are going to go to this newer team. So again, that will enable the current team to ensure that these newer cases won't be three years or longer or two years or longer. We will try to tackle those as they come in, as opposed to them becoming backlogged. I hope that makes sense. It, it does, but I guess I'm, I'm really concerned about uh, some of the testimonies I heard today about cases lingering for years and, and, and frankly, you know, a lack of information, people not even able to get a, a timeline information on where things are. Uh, I mean, what do, what, do we, what do we do about that? Sure. Um, so I will say, uh, Council Member, this is obviously a long term goal um, to reduce backlog. We're never going to be at a point where the backlog is zero but we do want to significantly reduce that. And so some of the actions I've mentioned in my testimony, as well as just a few moments ago, should help to reduce the backlog. But I also want to highlight that, you know, our cases are complicated. Um, they are not similar to the type of cases that, they, for example, the EEOC gets. EEOC enforces uh, about five pieces of law. We enforce 18 different sort of pieces of law. We have 21 protected traits, as you know. And so when a case comes in with multiple claims, alleging multiple statutes with various protected traits, it does make it difficult. But, um, but as I mentioned earlier, we can try to make sure our process is more efficient. That's why we're doing the industry standard study to see if we can fine tune our process to make our process more expedient, number one. Number two, the fact finding conferences, again, should expedite the process a little bit so that we can, again, resolve the cases a little bit faster despite the number of claims that will be coming through the door. All right. Um, I mean, why does the, 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 the number of, of types of cases that you handle, why does that sort of necessarily mean that cases take longer? Sure, because different statutes, for instance, if you have a case that implicates the Protecting Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, uh, might also implicate DC FMLA uh, claims. Um, so when you have a multitude of claims that come through like that, there are different factual information that OHR is required to obtain in order to see whether or not there's probable cause uh, to, to, to believe that discrimination occurred um, under the, the PPWFA law or whether or not the DC FMLA was violated. So because there are two different types of um, in, in that example, different sort of factual evidence that we have to collect, it does take longer. And so, or if we go back to a simpler example of looking at multiple protected traits being alleged in the Human Rights Act claims, for instance, if you've got a race, if you've got a sex, and you've got a disability claim, those are, diff again, different facts that would give rise to those claims. They're not the same. And so they require more time. Um, I wrote and, uh, and, and we funded this committee funded a budget support act subtitle requiring a quarterly report on prior quarter case uh, processing statistics and I see that you're planning 
to submit the first report at the end of this quarter. Um, will, will that report meet the, the statutory requirements? Uh, Council member, I think our office has been in touch with your office to say that um, we will meet uh, some of the requirements in that statute, but we will not be able to meet all of it in this initial report as we are trying to finish this case management system that will track the kind of data that um, we should be able to obtain under this statute. Um, additionally, as I mentioned in the testimony, we hope to hire a data analyst because currently our enforcement managers um, and the teams behind those teams are the ones collecting that data, which detracts from their work and actually resolving the cases. And so uh, once we're able to do that, then we hope to be able to give you a more comprehensive detailed report in compliance with the statute. So um, I can't remember what the funding was, but it, it did it not uh, fund new um, enforcement managers. Um, I believe it funded one FTE council member. And so we're going to use that FTE for the data analysts that um, can support this work. And um, so we're working up a position description and a posting so that we can hire that person to come on board and fully comply with the law. What's the, what's the timeline for uh, trying to get that FTE in the door? Uh, sure, as I mentioned, uh, we, are, we currently have a position description that we're working with, and then we've got to get that approved by DCHR, uh, get that posted, uh, and then conduct the interviews. Um, and so we're hoping perhaps in the next 30 to 45 days. Okay. I'm hoping my uh, HR manager isn't saying that's, that's incorrect, <laughs> but I think she's confirming that it is. All right. Well, I mean, we'll be we'll be halfway through the fiscal year soon, so I, I hope that is correct. Um, <clears throat> of all the agencies this committee oversees, yours has experienced the most dramatic growth in FTE count. But as you noted in your pre-hearing responses, getting actual workers into all those roles can be challenging. And it sounds like an inability to offer competitive compensation has been a challenge. Uh, have you communicated that to the mayor's office as part of this year's budget preparations? Yes, I have. And uh, you added 19 people in the last 16 months or so, but lost nine. That makes makes me a little worried about the agency's ability to fill the rem remaining vacancies this fiscal year. What are you hearing from DCHR about the, the remaining vacancies? So I can tell you, Council Member, that um, I personally reached out to the uh, director of DCHR, and they have been very helpful. Um, they have agreed to expedite our process so that we can more quickly uh, complete our onboarding, recruiting, hiring process. And so they have been very supportive of our efforts to do this, um, and they understand the the. Um, necessity to fill these positions. And my HR manager, I can tell you, she has been working day and night um, vigorously to fulfill these uh, positions. Um, if you like, I can give you a rundown, a little bit better of what we've done in FY22 so far. Um, so FY22, we've already extended 13 offers. Um, we still have 15 that are currently pending um, that we hope to, uh, hopefully will become positions if the candidates accept in the next uh, 10 to 15 days, and then we expect to fill uh, 15 additional positions after that. So I do feel very confident that um, at least on what is under our control, we'll be able to extend the offers to fill those positions. Uh, with respect to challenges that I uh, addressed in the responses regarding competitive salary and things of that nature, that's the kind of issue where I'm looking to see if we can reprogram some of the funding in order to ensure that we have competitive salaries that can compete in this market. Um, I, you know, I think as you know, uh, at OHR, uh, the positions require expert experience and knowledge in looking at human rights cases. Um, can, you mentioned the um, fact-finding conference initiative that, that, that you set up for backlog cases. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and sort of where you are in that process. Is that, is that happening now? Or are you still setting that up? Sure, so um, we visited this idea, I wanna say three or four years ago and it just didn't take off. Um, and so what I've asked the enforcement managers to do is to pilot 
um, because we've already got uh, some idea of the structure. Um, we are working with partners from the EEOC who do this more frequently, uh, particularly the EEOC's field office in Baltimore to help out with training our staff on how to conduct fact-finding conferences. So in fact, it is in the enforcement manager's performance goal to ensure that they pilot this program at least once or twice in, in upcoming quarters. Um, the new SWAT team will also be utilizing this, this fact-finding conference um, opportunity so that they can also run it, test it, make sure that um, it's working well and that it is expediting the cases the way it should. Um, and to that end, you know, we wanna make sure there's a full-time attorney dedicated to that team to make sure that these processes are being executed smoothly. Okay. Uh, well, I want to um, welcome my colleague, Council Member Henderson. Uh, do, do you have a statement or just questions? No questions, I'd like to keep it going. Here we are. We'll jump right in. Welcome. Glad to have you. Awesome. Uh, good afternoon. Well, first off, good afternoon, Chairman White. Good to see you. <laughs> um, good afternoon, Director, um, and to your team. Um, I actually want to pick up on the conversation that you were having uh, with the Chairman about vacancies. Um, so, you know, I've had this conversation with the head of DCHR as well. Like, I've, I just hopped on the website really quickly, just as I'm trying to understand um, what is the salary range that we're talking about here in terms of what you were saying around competitiveness. And I'm already getting kind of frustrated because I can't even, like, OHR doesn't even come up as, like, a mm -hmm. office um, when I you know, trying to do a search. So if somebody was looking for jobs specifically with your agency, they would already have difficulty in doing that. But I guess that's not necessarily something that you can control. Um, you mentioned that um, you all have lost nine people. Uh, I'm curious whether or not um, you all or, OHR, or your HR director engages in any sort of exit interview conversation. Um, Cause you're saying compensation, but it could be something completely different in terms of um, I think we have the vacancy rate at about 40% now of, of your FTE positions. Sure. Um, so Councilmember Henderson, I want to thank you for letting me know about the challenges you're having on, um, on the website and searching for, for OHR uh, position. That's really great feedback and good to know. Um, and so I want to make sure I understand your question. Um, you want to know. Um, do you guys do an exit interview with candidates who are leaving to try to understand why they were going, right? Because there was a period of time where the agency, it wasn't about salary. It was about organization and feeling like they couldn't move up and morale and all of those different types of things. And so I know you were bringing one issue to us, but there were other issues that, you know, predated you that I'm curious about whether or not they've been resolved. Sure. Um, I, I'm going to let my HR manager uh, perhaps provide more details if she has any, but I, I will say that my understanding is that we do conduct the exit interviews using the forms provided by DCHR. Um, okay. And I will also add that to my understanding, the losses that we had, um, which were, I believe, uh, four in FY21 and uh, five in FY22, um, you know, those were, to my understanding, not related to concerns about morale or working at OHR, if that's what you were trying to address. Yes, yes. Okay, but let me let my uh, human resource manager, Ayanna, at least if she wants to add anything. Good afternoon, council member. Uh, yes, so we do conduct internal exit interviews, as well as there are exit interviews done also by DCHR that are optional for the employee. As you stated, there could be a variety of different reasons why an employee um, decides to exit the agency. Um, but what I can say is that we've worked to address any internal concerns. So as the director mentioned in her testimony, we have offered now or are trying to offer incentive programs. We're also looking to um, develop career growth opportunities at OHR so that people see that they have upward mobility. And if you look at our hires from last year, you'll see that several of the hires that um, we did make, um, we were able to promote internal candidates um, to Great. other positions. Um, so I think that we have been working to address previous concerns, but um, okay. the reasons do vary. Okay. Um, I want to ask about uh, a little bit, dig a little bit deeper sort of into the backlog situation. Um, so last year I asked the question, you weren't here, but well, I saw yeah, one hearing, but last performance oversight rather, uh, my one question was, um, what is the case that has been pending the longest at the agency? 
And so I'm going to ask you that question now. Uh, your question what, is what, what is the case that is pending the longest at the agency? Yes. So okay. last year there were 140 cases that were at least three years old. Has that number shrunk? Um, let me double check that number. Uh, so I can tell you in FY21, we had 27 cases that were closed within three years of docketing um, and 57 um, within three or more. So in FY22, it does look like it has dropped because it's 14 closed cases within three years and 19 closed within three or more. So it, that okay, number so has dropped. Are we prioritizing these older cases as we um, hire more people and, and work through the process? Because at least my understanding in terms of the lingo, right? If you have documented my case, that means that you all believe that I have some type of uh, something beyond just a general inquiry or general it states complaint. A claim. What's that? It states a claim. Is that what you yes. were trying to say? Yes. Yes. Um, so we don't know 100% that there's there there, but you're saying like, okay, perhaps, right? Um, and so one of the things that I you know, I'm deeply concerned about for folks is that if your case has been pending for three plus years, you have been sitting with whatever this is unresolved for that period of time, and that there should be a level of urgency to resolving those cases um, as soon as we can. So how, how are we doing in terms of prioritization with those older cases? Yeah, you know, Councilmember Henderson and Chairperson, you know, reducing backlog requires a multifaceted solution, right? It's not just a, a one solution um, that's going to fix it. So uh, part of it is this SWAT team that we've, we've, we're have we trying to build out um, and who will have these older cases so that the current folks will not have backlog cases. But the other part of this solution is to ensure, and I think maybe this is what you're trying to get and I agree with, is to have high retention rates so that we have institutional knowledge so that we don't have to sort of you know, start over again and training new employees that takes time. And, and from my observation, what has happened in the past is that, you know, when I say past, I mean over the course of several years, I don't mean just last year, um, we have lost people, investigators. Uh, and so then people, new uh, investigators that come in, they inherit older cases um, from the other investigators. So there's no continuity of service, if you will. I, I understand so, that part, what you're saying, but what I wanna make sure is that even if the, if the case file is passed along, the next person isn't putting that on the bottom of their stack. Well, exactly right. right. And that's why I'm saying, let's put those age cases into a dedicated team. Let's let them tackle that. Um, and and also, of course, ensure Wait, so that every do we get investigator team, is, is making sure that they're tackling the cases appropriately at the appropriate speed that they should be working on in a timely way. When that's why we also divided team? our team from one team to three teams, and now it'll be four, so that they are not just one manager overseeing all of the cases that are pending. We have three managers that are overseeing it, and soon will be four managers that are overseeing it. But when does this new team come on? So um, we're in the process of uh, recruiting, and we've got about three positions where we're making so another 45 to 60 days before we even really take off with new team. That's probably correct. Okay, I'm over my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the, the director, you, the, your new case management system, DC Right Tracker or, or DCRT, RT, has uh, received a phase one implementation, but uh, you still have some uh, work to do on uh, phase two. What, what's the timeline for uh, getting this fully implemented? Yeah, we're working on funding for that to continue phase two. And as soon as we uh, uh, have funding for that, then we'll be able to continue to implement and also work closely with Octo on the timeline as their teams also uh, change is my understanding. So we're hoping in the next 30 to 60 days, um, we'll, we'll be able to uh, have funding to support that work that Octo requires. Okay. And uh, once the funding is secured, do you know how long it'll take? I'm, I'm, I'm going to let my uh, Deputy Director Mamadou Samba answer that question just to make sure I don't give you an inaccurate response. Mamadou? Yes. 
Uh, good morning, Council Member. Um, so right now we have been working very closely, as the interim said, with ACTO to uh, define the guidelines, uh, the requirements, also set a timeline for the accomplishment. And so we are hoping that, depending on what we start, but it should probably take about three months to fully uh, build out phase two, and then another two months for the testing and making sure that the functionalities are up to par and then uh, launching uh, a month after that. So roughly about six months to complete phase two. Wonderful. And uh, your pre-hearing questions indicated that the public will have access to DCRT as, in, as part of the next phase. Is that right? I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was on mute. I think that might be the latter end of phase two. I'm not sure that that will be um, part of phase two, uh, it might be phase three, I think is where that will be. How many phases are there? As I understand it, three. Okay. When the public has access, what, uh, what kind of information will they be able to, to access? Mamana, do you want to address that? Yes. Uh, so the public will be able to file cases directly, uh, you know, using the, uh, the case management system. Uh, they will also have access to uh, case timeline. They'll be able to communicate directly with uh, the investigators. Um, they'll be able to, right now, is the system is not fully functional. So when they do have access, they can file claims directly from the court instead of um, the way it is currently set up. Um, <clears throat> okay. We've, we've heard some concerns that you are particularly underfunded in your IT department. Is this uh, an outstanding area of, of need? So um, I, I don't believe we have IT allocated funding. Um, and so I am working towards making sure that we have, um, uh, I think we have an opportunity, let me say this, to reprogram what's in our budget to dedicate to um, IT funding. But obviously, our FY23 is still being formulated, so I can't speak anymore by FY23. Um, what, 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 how, how, how are you doing with IT needs? Uh, are you all good and on track? Um, can you elaborate more, Chairperson, on IT needs? So um, to me, I, I do think that the agency requires an IT officer of some kind to sure. assist with things like, you know, day-to-day -day things like connection, VPN, um, using uh, 365, uh, making sure that our uh, new employees are uh, fully onboarded and connected. And so we currently have our administrative officer who does that. But um, one of the observations I've made uh, while I've been at LHR is that because we've uh, not had um, as much room that people have taken on additional responsibilities. And so I wanna make sure that we have a dedicated, as the agency grows, we have an, an added need for that kind of dedicated support. So that that's why we wanna get an IT officer of some kind to make sure that we can match our growth with the technology needs. Yeah. Um, you know, things like printers, that sort of thing. Hey, yeah, I mean, it seems like a big agency to not have an IT officer. Um... So you, um, you reported in your FY21 performance uh, report that uh, from uh, the time from unsuccessful mediation to letter of determination was over 160 days in five out of six cases. I, I recognize that it takes a lot of work to produce a letter of determination, but anecdotally, do you see that turnaround time uh, coming down at all uh, in recent months? I, I am hoping that it will come down in coming months. Um, and I would say within uh, eight months to a year um, because we did implement a, um, a new process for the letter of determination. Um, it might've been that our older letter of determination and for short, I'll just call it LOD as we call it here, um, had a lot of perhaps information that were extraneous. And so we wanna make sure to cut down on that to allow um, investigators to have more um, uh, efficient information, but doesn't take as long. 
So to that end, um, we hope that the time that it takes to actually produce an LOD does go down again in tandem with a new team. Uh, part of this process, the fact-finding conference, um, added attorneys dedicated to the uh, different teams that we have. All of these uh, implementations, I'm hoping that will enable us to reduce the time it takes to produce an LOD. Okay. The FY22 budget included um, funds for a study on how the Human Rights Act case, uh, case processing deadlines could be improved. Uh, you predicted that the vendor will complete the report this fiscal year. Uh, do you anticipate that the council will receive that report this fiscal year? Um, I would say either at the end of this fiscal year or um, if not, early FY23. Um, I, we've just selected the vendor, so it's hard to say. <laughs> I, I personally haven't had an opportunity to speak with a vendor, but I know that my deputy director has just in the last couple of weeks. And so if you want, I'm happy to give you information as we go along um, mm -hmm. to ensure um, that you are aware of the progress. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, your office hired a vendor to do secret shopper probes of landlords to see if they engage in discrimination against voucher holders, uh, which I think is a great idea. It sounds like for about 30% of the testing subjects, the vendor couldn't tell one way or the other. How, how do you interpret that finding? Um, so, council member, I am... Um you know, uh, being in the seat for just a little over three months. <laughs> I, I'm doing a lot of things, but I'm also digesting that report. And so I hope to work with ERC who conducted that particular study to understand more about what happened there, to be honest. And so again, happy to provide you with more information as I converse with the team at ERC about um, the details of that report. Um, when do you expect to get uh, details? I'm sorry, do I expect to get details? Well, I'm sorry, when? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I hope to reach out to them within the next uh, two weeks. Okay. Uh, we've received, you may have heard it, uh, testimony today advocating for more director's inquiries on the issue of voucher discrimination. Do you have thoughts on, on that? I'm sorry, say that again, council member. Uh, uh, we, we received testimony today uh, uh, advocating for more director's inquiries on the issue of voucher discrimination. Do, do you have thoughts on that recommendation? Sure, I do. And, and that's why I want to have a conversation with the team at ERC about the study that they did, because I do believe that that could be a basis for uh, instituting the director's inquiries. And one of my goals at OHR um, has been to look to see if we uh, should do more director's inquiries in cases in those sort of circumstances. So I agree. Wonderful, I'm, I'm sure they will uh, be very happy to, uh, to, to talk to you. Yes, I'm happy to work with them. And you know, we've been having conversations with the advocates. Um, you know, I can tell you, I had a meeting with them in January and another one recently in February. So um, looking forward to our continued collaboration and discussions with them because and I think I may have mentioned this in one of the other hearings with you council member, but um, we can't tackle this alone. This is a community effort. And so I rely on the community to give us information that we need to help um, tackle discrimination in the district. Wonderful. Uh, great uh, openness and, and collaboration. Uh, I, I hear frequently from local anti-discrimination advocates about the election of remedies doctrine and how it can have unintended uh, effects on access to counsel. Your pre-hearing responses indicate that you'll add information on this topic to your notice materials. Can, can you tell me a little more about where in the process complaint, complainants will uh, learn about the limits on their ability to move their, their cases to court? Sure, um, they will get that information at the start of the process, um, as well as in the process in the middle and, um, and the process, um, the, the probable cause finding at the end so that there is information throughout the process. Um, we also will ensure to include once we have finalized the, the, the content of that notice in our training materials. Um, as you know, we do a number of outreach activities and training. And so we'll make sure to include that in there so that our HRLs and our community organizations that help to spread the word about what OHR does, they're also aware of, of that notice. Wonderful. Um, you, you probably heard this uh, today as well, but we, we heard from the employment bar um, 
uh, concerns about uh, how OHR breaks down charging documents into separate sheets for each cause of action and party. Uh, they say it's really challenging for pro se complainants in particular to double check that all the relevant facts get included for each charge. Why does uh, OHR use that approach? Sure. So first, I want to say that um, we docket uh, charges under different statutes separately. So again, if you have a claim, you would have a PPWFA for the protecting pregnant workers charge. And then if you also have a uh, claim for DCFMLA, that would also get a DCFMLA charge. Um, for the reasons, similar to the reasons I explained earlier, uh, the different claims and the different statutes require different factual analyses. So they are related um, oftentimes. There is an overlap, but there is sort of a separate factual and legal analyses that have to go hand in hand. So that's that's one of the reasons why historically this is the way that we've, we've um, docketed the charges. Um, there, It's also a means by which we can track what kind of cases we're getting. Um, but, you know, as I informed the advocates when I met with them, I'm open to looking at that again to see whether we could have a different way of um, docketing our charges to refine efficiencies. My goal is for the OHR to fine tune our efficiency so that we are much more expedient in the work that we do. But um, I, I do wanna focus on rebuilding OHR and to make sure that our, we have a solid foundation of a, a team of employees that work on these cases so that they are competent in the work that we do, that, that they get the necessary trainings that they require to execute on, on, on the work before we change uh, the process. But we are, I am gonna work with the advocates to consider their ideas and proposals and see if there's a solution to this issue that they've raised. Okay, do, do, do other tribunals um, uh, require sort of a separating out like this? Well, I'm gonna hope to find that out in an industry standard study. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Um, you know, I know, um, I, I believe it was Ms. Chong that had mentioned the EEOC, but as I mentioned, the EEOC has about five um, laws that they enforce, whereas OHR has a, a variety, um, a much more variety. So um, as soon as I get more information about that, we'll be glad to share with you our progress and our assessment. Appreciate it. Um... Many of the district agencies that uh, qualified as covered entities with major public contact received low language access compliance scores in your FY20 report. Um, but you docketed only eight language access cases in FY21 and three in FY22 to date. Well, why do you think so few language access uh, shortcomings lead to formal filings? And uh, council member, I apologize. I do have our language access director, Rosa Carrillo. Um, and I, I didn't get a chance to promote her earlier when we were doing the swearing in. May we bring her on? Certainly, I'll swear her in uh, very quickly. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, I'm going to swear you in uh, very quickly, so I'd ask that you raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to provide to the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Oh, wonderful. I appreciate it. Uh, so so the, the question is, is with regard to uh, covered um, uh, agencies that, that qualify as covered entities with major public uh, contact uh, that have received low language access compliance scores in your FY20 report. Uh, but for some reason, there are very few uh, docketed uh, cases uh, on this issue. And so the, the question is, uh, why so few language access shortcomings lead to formal filings? Sure. Um, to start with the main uh, to answer that question first, it's some many cases we for language access cases when uh, an individual file that has to go through a process of pre-investigation. In that process of pre-investigation is what we call immediate action. So in that process, it could be resolved within the period of I don't know two or three months where the complaint is being resolved informally. We call it. 
So if an individual file a complaint because they not receive interpretation services when they file for not any application for public benefits, I will call uh, the language access coordinator for that agency and we'll solve the problem immediately and we'll be providing a system. If the issue is bigger than that and if the agency does not we'll say, um, acknowledge compliance with the violation of Language Access Act, that case will move on onto the investigation. That one is docketed. So many of those cases uh, in fiscal year 21 uh, were solved during that pre-investigation process. Um, I have my notes here. There were uh, nine of those cases or language access inquiries that were solved during the pre-investigation process. Okay. So if there's an issue, you try to work with the agency to get it addressed and those cases don't, don't get docketed. Okay. Um, as, as part of uh, the agency's push uh, to enable agencies, uh, as part of your push to uh, enable agencies to hire candidates that require bilingual skills, uh, you noted that you will need additional funding. Have, have you raised that need with the mayor's uh, budget proposal team? So council member, I, I will address that. Um, so my understanding is that we are working with the roundtable uh, members to identify the linguistic expert and the cost associated with it. At this time, we don't know the cost. Um, we also want to work with DCHR um, to get their partnership and their thoughts on this process as we're working on this for screening of applicants. And so once we have more information, um, we will be able to uh, estimate the costs. Could right. be that DCHR may have in-house experts um, that could lend a hand. All right, I guess I'd be concerned with the time we're getting really close to the budget dropping. It, it doesn't sound like this process is going to uh, reach a uh, sort of a, a, a conclusion uh, by the time the mayor's budget proposal comes out. Is that is that your expectation? Um, so I can tell you, Council Member, we are still continuing to work with the mayor's office on the budget. Okay. Um, well, I should say we continue to have conversations. <laughs> I don't mean to say that we haven't, um, you know, um, discussed it. We continue to have conversations. Uh, your pre-hearing responses mentioned a direct director's inquiry into a private company where there were reports of widespread race-based harassment. But based on that experience, do you think the office is likely to carry out more uh, investigations in that vein going forward? I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I understand your question. Do, you, do I think we're going to get, we're going to carry out more DIs, director inquiries, to address that kind of widespread issue? That's right. Yes, I, I certainly expect so, council member. This was one that I can tell you I was um, involved in um, looking at. And so if, if uh, we have similar cases of that kind, um, I will certainly personally be very uh, uh, interested and I would want to make sure that we start to look at a director's inquiries. In fact, we recently got some um, similar reporting um, with respect to um, a specific community in DC. And so I am taking a look to see, uh, the team here, I should say, is taking a look to see whether or not we can do a director's inquiry. Uh, we received testimony earlier, raising concerns that the office does not uh, except racial discrimination complaints based on disparate impact analysis. What, what's your response to that concern? Sure, council member. So I uh, communicated our um, thoughts on that with the advocates when I met with them recently. Um, historically, we've not been able to uh, process these sort of cases because it does require extensive statistical analysis, comparative statistical analysis which will require a statistical expert. Um, and so when we look at disparate impact, it's looking to see if a neutral policy has a disparate impact on a certain community, a certain group of individuals. And so that requires looking at the policy, examining it and looking at the number of, uh, of employees that are impacted by this particular policy. Um, what I did mention and I'll mention here also is that um, you know, with the increase in the number of FTEs that we are getting, um, we will continue to consider whether or not we can take on these sort of more complicated um, cases, but we also um, can partner with the EEOC. And so what I've asked the 
the advocates to do is to let me know when they have cases of the sort where it does uh, look like it's a disparate impact case that's important for the district to, to address. And so we can you know, uh, potentially partner with EEOC who has much bigger resources than OHR does to see if they can offer a statistical expert that we can use to work on these types of cases. And so, um, you know, I do have a good relationship with the EEOC and their leadership there and, and confident that we can work through that if, if we uh, had a case that requires it. Okay. Uh, I, I am concerned that, I mean, their, their argument is that the, the law allows for, and I would assume therefore requires us to, you know, permit uh, a, a disparate impact cases. I don't know how many of those we have or, or would have, um, but but it, it seems like uh, something that is important that, that we figure out. I think your notion that, you know, if there are the folks, if there are not a lot of these cases, if, if we can, you know, partner with the EEOC or others, uh, I think that would be important. But if, if we can't, it, it seems like we're going to have to uh, get someone who can do um, a statistical analysis. Um, please go ahead. No, no, I was to say, I, you know, with everything else, I'm happy to provide you with, with updates and progress um, in the coming months as we look into these cases. And um, as I mentioned to, to individuals that have contacted me, and I will say it here publicly, that, you know, if there's any issue um, that you'd like to discuss with me, my door is open. Um, you know, I can give you the email in the chat here if anybody reach out, wants to reach out to me or our deputy director um, so that we can promptly address these issues. Uh, as, as you well know, several bills have passed in recent years or are currently under consideration that would expand OHR's responsibilities uh, in novel ways, areas such as restroom access, eviction record sealing, and workplace marijuana testing. Your office has explained that you'll uh, diligently perform the work assigned to you, but worry about diluting your mission or overburdening your team. Do you think that there's a gap between the district government's ability to adjudicate disputes between private parties other than the type of uh, discrimination cases you, you currently handle? So, I mean, do we need a new entity to start to handle some of these cases? Um, I, I'm not sure I fully understand that question, council member, but um, from what I can gather, if you're asking, is there another agency or another organization within the district government that should take on some of these additional provisions, I think that I'd have to think on that a little bit more, um, consult with my team and, and get back to you on that. Okay. What, what I'm saying is that, you know, so the, the notion of overburdening or diluting the mission of the agency is, is, is a real one. Well, what I wonder is, it, it, do we need another, a different agency that handles uh, some of these disputes between private parties uh, be, because the, the things being put on OHR over the years is, is really expanded. And, you know, we want to make sure it can perform its core functions. So that, that's what I'm suggesting is where. Right. You, and yeah. so to that end, um, council member, I would say, uh, I'm not sure if we need a new agency or if we can go to another agency. I think that I'd be happy to have a more detailed conversation with your office uh, about that uh, idea and explore ways to ensure that there is a home for, for the laws that um, we have legislated. Okay. Uh, I do wanna thank you. You've mentioned this in your um, testimony for going out and doing and know your rights presentations and other engagements with ANCs in, in, in recent months. I was very glad to, to hear that. Uh, and, and I would be interested in helping you promote your upcoming listening labs to the extent that you um, are interested. So if, um, if you are interested in you, you have your team share the dates with, with my team as you firm those up, we'll be happy to uh, help promote those. Absolutely. Uh, my, my colleague, Council Member Nadeau, uh, obviously has been a champion for street harassment prevention and response, and uh, I appreciate the work OHR has done to implement her Street Harassment Prevention Act, or SHIPA. Uh, SHIPA has now officially sunset, but I was pleased to see that you're still supporting bystander intervention training for district employees. Um, when, when do you think they, those will, will go live or, or are you doing those now? Uh, the Stand Up Against Street Harassment, they have been going live. We have had, I wanna say, 
um, about eight uh, to date, and we hope to continue to partner with uh, L'Oreal Paris and Hollerback, who does an excellent job of these trainings. And I, and I understand the council actually, um, or the staff of the council has attended these uh, yeah. these trainings and I hear they're, they're fantastic. So we yeah. hope to continue to support that work in the, in the year to come. Great. Uh, SHIPA called for two reports, but only one was completed before the law sunset. The second report was supposed to cover agency implementation of the model policies that the Advisory Committee on Street Harassment had developed. Uh, what's the status of the model policy implementation? Unfortunately, Councilmember, I, I would need to get back to you with that one. Um, our um... We lost our, our director of that team <laughs> recently. And so we've been scrambling to make sure we're able to do the work um, of that unit together. And so I do need to get back to them um, to ask them about that status. Um, I, uh, I appreciate the, the case law overview that you provided regarding OHR's authority to dismiss uh, cases for administrative convenience, also known as exercising prosecutorial discretion. Uh, no surprise, my office sometimes hears from complainants who claim that there's uh, judicial precedent authorizing such dismissals in some of your spheres of protection, but not others. Uh, has OHR addressed that argument? That, that is to say there are some places where some folks say that there, there are some places that you don't have prosecutorial discretion. That in some places we don't have prosecutorial discretion. Yes, or to the discretion to dismiss cases for administrative convenience. So the, the basis for that language comes from the statutory provision under the Human Rights Act. And so perhaps that is what is sort of giving rise to that belief that um, we have a limited prosecutorial discretion. Um, of course, as you know, uh, some of the other statutes borrow the procedures uh, outlined under the Human Rights Act, for instance, the Fair Criminal Record Screening Act. Um, and so uh, to that end, then our um, discretionary authority would, would, would transfer to those cases that rely on the Human Rights Act procedures. Okay. Um... We'll, we'll touch base with, with your team as necessary on that to, to make sure we, we understand it. Um, and uh, about 6% of your expendable budget went to uh, CBEs or certified business enterprises. Do you think there are opportunities to improve in this area or, or do you think that's about what we should expect uh, given your specialized nature of, of your contracting needs? Um, I always think there's always room for improvement, so I would probably say yes. Um, whether or not significantly, I'm not sure, but if you want more information, I'm sure our AFO, Adrena Dean, can respond to that. But I think, you know, we can always improve. Okay. Uh, Chairperson Aizawa, um, uh, I do want to first uh, congratulate you for nearly 10 years of service on, on the commission and, and thank you uh, for that service. It is uh, difficult and thankless work. Uh, so at least you get one thank you uh, here. Um, you've noted that you intend to improve the commission's case management system, but that the vendor is throwing up unexpected challenges. Has Octo provided support in uh, evaluating alternatives? Thank you very much for that congratulation and that question. Uh, on this one, I am going to ask uh, Chief Judge Pearson to respond since she has been in close contact with uh, Octo. Chair Anzawa and thank you, Commissioner, I'm sorry, <laughs> Council Member White. Um, yeah, Octo has been very, very helpful um, when we were notified that um, Synergy, the vendor, was no longer going to be able to host the case management system um, on its server. Um, we did work with Octo to get the system transferred to their server, um, but it's still a proprietary uh, system, so they're not able to provide the actual support for the system, um, but they are hosting it on their servers. Um, and so we did also have um, preliminary discussions going forward because now that we're on the Opto server, uh, it's increased cost for us from the vendor. 
Um, so we are, they are going to do a proposal for us of whether or not they can actually build out a portion of uh, OHR's new case management system that we would just add on to that um, for the commission. And so we don't have that proposal from them yet, but we just have those initial discussions. Okay, um, I, I appreciate that. Um, sounds like there's a, a bit of work ahead, but uh, but sounds like you're working uh, with with Octo to find a resolution. Yeah. Okay. A um, a litigation manual for pro se complainants sounds uh, very useful. Do you anticipate that uh, volunteer commission members will perform that work? We'll we'll put that manual together. So they're in this no. is pre-hearing responses. Um, it yeah. is the um, ALJs that are putting the manual together. Okay, wonderful. Uh, do, do you have a, a rough timeline on that? Um, I think it's gonna be done in the next 45 days. That's great, that is great. Uh, I do uh, wanna thank you all for, for standing up committees to support your work. Uh, if you could briefly summarize your uh, rules committee uh, proposed changes to the municipal regulations. So uh, the commission in my uh, 10 years of service has looked at the rules several times, uh, but had not been able to actually move those proposed changes. So we do have to look at um, the cumulative uh, proposals that have been made over the years. And uh, especially uh, the recent um, observations where there may be a conflict between uh, the municipal regulations and some other applicable regulations. And so uh, it will be a very detailed work and um, we will be uh, assisted, uh, of course, ably by the ALJs. Um, it'll be a little premature to say exactly which section, mm -hmm. um, but uh, what we did uh, in the last fiscal year with the emergency rulemaking for section 408, that gives you one uh, sense of where we're headed, that um, there are instances where um, the way OHR or the, the commission approaches things a little differently, and that might confuse the litigants, but particularly the pro se uh, litigants. And so we do want to pay attention to those and, and bring our experiences uh, uh, together to address the uh, relevant chapters um, fairly comprehensively. So it is a very big piece of work. Obviously, OHR is uh, working on that, they have uh, quite a lot to say on the matter. So this is actually a, a big collaboration between the commission, the ALJs and, and OHR as well. That's great. Um, it, it looks like the percentage of commission cases taking over 15 months to resolve held roughly steady in fiscal year 22. Uh, have you been involved in finding a fellow or clerk to support the, the commission at ALJs? Yes, so we did uh, mention this last year and uh, we are making progress, uh, but on this one, uh, perhaps Chief Judge Pearson could provide additional details. Sure, yes, we have um, going to continue this year with a, a partnership with Georgetown Law School uh, where they pay a portion um, of the salary of the fellow. Um, and so we have received a good number of applications and we're starting interviews next week. Wonderful. Uh, how, how many AL ALJs uh, do, do we have right now? We have two. We have two. two. Okay. Um, do, do you plan to get back up to three? So um, we wait. did. Oh. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. So this was something that we mentioned uh, last year to you. Um, so this is a, a complicated um, math that uh, Director Kine has to go through in terms of where she should make an investment in order to address the most urgent um, priorities of the, uh, the office. And so for the time being, uh, given the kind of backlog that OHR is struggling with uh, versus the caseload that we have at the moment, and, mm -hmm. and this could change any, any minute, but this is based on what we know now. Uh, we are um, at a situation where the 
a third ALJ budget or a part of it could be better invested in um, uh, addressing, uh, helping the ALJs uh, um, uh, move case, cases efficiently, but also uh, taking into account other things they do in order to inform the commission, in order to uh, inform litigants, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we feel that currently the best way to, um, for the commission to, to uh, execute its task would be to uh, invest in the fellow position and the law clerk position, as opposed to third ALJ position. But um, that is not foreclosed. That, is, uh, uh, um, that discussion can be opened at a later date. And so um, that is my perspective, but obviously um, Director Kang may wish to say something more on that. I, I don't, I think that's correct that we're looking at the uh, demand of the caseload and the budget. And, um, and so we are, as uh, Chair Aizawa said, um, we'll reassess um, as, as the need arises, but we are investing that money for the fellow and the law clerk. Okay. Um, when was the last time you heard from DGS about your request to use the uh, former Board of Elections hearing room for uh, commission proceedings? I checked in with DGS about three weeks ago and um, was told it's, you know, the, it's on their horizon. It's still under consideration as they're looking at the overall space in the entire building with MPD moving into the building. Okay. Um, if, you, if you need help nudging them, uh, feel free to let us know. Okay. Uh, there are a couple commission members who missed three or four meetings in the last year and a half. I, I do recognize commissioners are volunteers and many of them uh, maintain busy professional lives. Do you have any concerns about the commission's ability to seat a quorum and carry out its business this year? Well, thank you for that question. Um, we have been able to carry out our business in the past in our meetings because we did manage to have a, a quorum. Um, we have also, I, I think the, the mo more important point is that we have enough volunteers to constitute tribunals. Mm -hmm. And this has been done in the past on a voluntary basis. We now have a rotation system so that uh, we don't have to waste time waiting for commissioners to, to volunteer. But we will have this rotational system where um, there will be uh, uh, commissioners automatically assigned. And if they have any conflicts, there will be another uh, person who can be appointed. And this way, um, I don't think uh, um, we're gonna have uh, a lot of uh, wastage of time in, in negotiating who's going to be on uh, a, a tribunal. Uh, are there any um, other areas where your fellow commissioners tell you they can't make uh, as much of a difference as they had initially hoped? Well, uh, these days we make sure when we interview commissioners that they are quite clear on the time commitments and what they are primarily required to do, which is to be on uh, tribunals. And so people come on board uh, based on that understanding. Um, I think commissioners, or I should say some of them would like to be more active in certain areas um, because we are all here because we are human rights advocates in, in one way or the other, as you know very well. Um, so in order to uh, address these concerns, uh, we are, basically standing up these committees and particularly the outreach committee has a lot to do in terms of um, uh, not only commission-based outreach programs, but to be out there alongside OHR when OHR is training or meeting uh, community members or um, uh, providing information at ANC meetings and whatnot that, that we are there alongside them. Um, so that is definitely one outlet. Um, and uh, Chairman White, I, I would just like to say that we are um, 
proposing this new initiative this year to look at our cases comprehensively, our historic cases, that, that is commission cases, to make sure that we understand trends, make sure that uh, um, really there is good coordination with OHR, uh, make sure that we can also predict trends uh, going forward. And so that's something that the commission members can also contribute to. Obviously, this is not something we can do alone, and we will be doing this with the ALJs and uh, OHR. Uh, we're very interested also in the industry standard um, study. We will be uh, very much informed by that um, to, to think about how we can improve our processes, but also where we could be more useful. So they are, these are the ways to try to get commit, uh, commission members to take interest in different aspects of what we do. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, those are um, those are all the questions that, that I have. I, I want to again uh, thank uh, uh, OHR, uh, the commission, uh, our, uh, our chief judge for the work that you and your teams do. Uh, I want to also thank you for being here uh, with us today for this, this important hearing. And I, I look forward to working with you all throughout the, the budget process and, and throughout the rest of the year. Thank you so much for the interest. Thank you. Have a, a wonderful rest of, of your day. Uh, I, I do want to note for, um, I want to thank all of our public witnesses for joining us as well and for uh, everyone who's uh, followed this hearing. Uh, I want to note that anyone who wishes to submit additional testimony related to any of these agencies, uh, we uh, um, written testimony is encouraged and will be made part of the official record. Uh, if you are interested in submitting written testimony, please email it to the Committee on Government Operations and Facilities at facilities at dccouncil.us. That is facilities at dccouncil.us. The record for this hearing will close at the close of business on Thursday, March 3rd. Now with that, the business before this committee is concluded. The time is now 5.23 p.m. And this performance oversight hearing of the committee is adjourned. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.